be here today. And also I'd like to thank all the activists who have been involved in local actions, over 70 local actions across the country. So this program right now, as we begin, is only the continuation of an entire day's worth of actions. My name is Awande Mtelezi. I am a organizer at the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center, an activist with the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and an activist with the Climate Justice Charter Movement. And now that I've made my introductions, we can begin with the opening by Professor Vishwa Satka. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Awande. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I am the chair of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center, a vibrant alliance partner of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, and I'm also an activist in the SAFC. A very uh, warm welcome to all of you, um, particularly the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, uh, Lechisa Tsunoli, uh, representatives of political parties, and uh, leaders from various movements and uh, organizations, community organizations, NGOs. Thank you for joining us this, this afternoon at this very, very historic uh, assembly. So many of you are in this space, in this conversation, because you understand what's at stake. Uh, you understand that everything you hold dear and everything you love is in jeopardy uh, with climate change. Uh, you understand that uh, a human being cannot survive at over 35 degrees Celsius. Um, it really becomes unbearable. Uh, you also understand that we are fast heading for a 1.5 degree Celsius overshoot in global temperature, and that risks everything. It takes us into what is considered a no analog state, and it brings uncertainties around our Earth system and our future as, as a species together with other non-human nature life forms. So while you are here and you are conscious and you wanted to be part of this conversation, we are a minority, actually. And in the context of the formation of the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign uh, from 2015 onwards, uh, at the onset of the worst drought in our history, we began to realize that we have to start connecting things up. So on the one hand, the hunger crisis was being exacerbated by high food prices. Uh, at the same time, the drought was ravaging communities and uh, life was really getting tough. Uh, day zeros, uh, et cetera, across different parts of the country and so on. But the idea was to connect this up, connect hunger with the drought, the drought with climate. And so we started doing that over the past few years. We also start connecting the right to food to food sovereignty. And in that context, we began to understand that this is the basis to bring to life a climate justice movement. And it germinated in that context. And today on the streets and in local community spaces across the country, six, over 68 uh, localized actions took place uh, around the rallying slogan, end hunger, end thirst, end pollution, and end climate harm. Amazing creativity flourished over the past few hours in our country. There were online plays, there were teach-ins, there were petitions, uh, sorry, there were pickets, uh, orange masks were worn and so on across the country. And this for us is what this platform is all about, is to give voice to these forces that are rallying to build a climate justice charter movement in our country at the front lines of these issues and they will prevail on this platform today. What we're also doing today on this platform is reaching out to our public representatives. And we are really challenging them to try and understand what is the urgency and what is at stake around the worsening climate crisis. We, uh, and, and, and uh, um, actually, Comrade Lechisa, uh, you know- Yeah, 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 go ahead, yeah, sure. <laughs> I know you from another place. <laughs> we reached out to know, all <laughs> we reached out to all these political parties, and of course, you know, um, it's been a bit disappointing. Um, some of them we couldn't find their contact information. Uh, some of them don't have web pages, etc. Uh, some of them are marching to foment a race war in one part of our country. Some are marching on the head office. Uh, some don't have answers to this issue, etc. 
Um, and, you know, as, as citizens, you know, between 30 to 40,000 of us voted for a public representative to be sitting in parliament. They earn over a million rands. We pay them as taxpayers. So it has been disappointing that there hasn't been a responsiveness uh, to an urgent call by South African citizens. But nonetheless, some amongst the parties have respected this. They respect the demos, they respect the people, and they have been responsive. And we're very grateful to those that have made the time and to be here today to engage in this debate. The second thing we're going to do here today is that we are going to grapple with climate science. And, you know, the government rescinded the declaration of a drought in July this year. This was the sixth year of our drought. We have challenged that publicly because it is uninformed in terms of climate science. We have consulted the top climate scientists in the country, and they have confirmed that the drought is ongoing. It's ravaging parts of Limpopo. It's still ravaging parts of the Eastern Cape and so on. In 2018, we sent a memorandum to the president and to parliament to consider convening an emergency sitting, emergency sitting of parliament because the 1.5 degrees Celsius report of the IPCC just came out. It rang the alarm bell the loudest around the climate crisis. And we really wanted the president to take the lead and convene all parties and to have a deliberation on what this means for us as a country, as a region, what does it mean for our policies and the just transition? Unfortunately, well, we were 65 organizations making this call, including with trade unions, but we were not uh, taken seriously. But since then, we have deepened our relationship with the leading climate scientists in the country that advise the IPCC, that even, by the way, advise high level governments. And we are very, very grateful to them, particularly the Global Change Institute at Wits University, uh, Professor Bob Scholes, Professor Colleen Vogel, and Professor Francois Engelbrecht. They've worked with us to translate what is the global science uh, into the South African context, to really understand what does uh, the shift in global averages mean for us. If we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius now globally, what does that mean for South Africa and our weather patterns and so on? So we have, in this time, really developed a relationship with our leading climate scientists. So we bring climate science front and center and we mainstream it in our politics, in our discourse. And they are here with us today and we want to share that science with parliament as well. The other thing we want to try and achieve today, and for us, this is very, very historic. It is to share the first climate justice charter in the world with parliament. We want to claim our right in the constitution, section 234, which provides for charters to be adopted. And uh, we really want our parliament to take this charter forward and, and, and deliberate on it and adopt it. It comes out of six years of activism, two years of intense deliberation with constituencies across society, really trying to grapple with what kind of transformative change do we want for the deep just transition? What kind of systemic transformations that we need? So in many ways, this is a people's charter. It expresses the aspirations of our society. And it's a charter that has been welcomed in the world. It's been welcomed in Australia. It's been welcomed in Germany. It's been welcomed in Canada. It's been welcomed by the, South Af uh, by the African Food Sovereignty Alliance on our continent. Uh, it's been welcomed by the Eco-Socialist International, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, we are path breaking uh, we are breaking with the idea of an NGO-driven uh, politics around climate. We are breaking with the idea of a celebrity politics. And we are breaking with the idea that um, climate politics is just for a few. Everybody's got to own the climate problem. And everybody got to own its solutions. And this is what has driven us to develop the Climate Justice Charter together with everybody. So we want to hand over the charter today, and that's, that's one of the core objectives of today's engagement. And then uh, maybe finally to say that what we are also doing here is inaugurating a mass-based climate justice charter movement. It's not going to stop here. There are 220 organizations that have endorsed this charter. Uh, our leading political foundations, the Mandela Foundation, the Gandhi Development Trust, the Amit Katrada Foundation, several movements, the Unemployed People's Movements, the uh, informal trader organizations, some of our trade unions, 
faith-based organizations, the leading children formations in our country and youth, et cetera. So 220 organizations have endorsed this charter. And uh, we are not going to stop here. So one of the tools we'll be launching here today is what we call the arc of South African life. Now I know comrades, Alachisa, you have to leave us a little early and we are adjusting our program around you. But the arc of South African life um, is something we'll tell you more about when we meet after this, but it will be launched today. And it's a tool for South African citizens to basically share their concerns. And we'll say more about it later. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Awande. Thank you, Prof. Uh, and now we can move on to a presentation by my colleague, Courtney. Hi all, I'm Courtney Morgan, also from the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center and an activist with the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign. I'm just going to share my screen and show you just a couple of clips and pictures from this morning's actions. There are still so many coming through on my phone as well as on social media. So this is by far not all of it, but just, just a clip. So I'm going to share my screen now. document put together over six years of campaigning has officially made it into Parliament and is being handed over at 2 p.m. this afternoon. This document basically outlines the changes that need to be taken up by government in order to achieve climate justice, which is essentially social justice. At the same time, it's so much more than just a charter. It's a tool to build a movement. It's a point of discussion and it's a symbol of hope. We have already been witnessing the disastrous effects of climate change today, from the droughts in Cape Town, the floods in Mozambique, and the Californian as well as the Australian fires. The climate crisis is a threat to society and the most vulnerable are those that contribute the least to the, the Earth's carbon emissions. Climate change is an issue that is intersectional, meaning topics such as racism, sexism, gender-based violence, colonialism, and classism needs to be confronted when discussing climate change as all the issues interlink. And what's great about this charter is that it encompasses and explains every intersection of the climate crisis. It is available to read in 11 South African languages and is a great tool to learn more about the climate crisis and the plans put in place to attain climate justice and as I said, social justice. It brings me great joy to say that Parktown High School for Girls has officially endorsed the Climate Justice Charter, along with 226 organizations We need to unlearn the shock doctrines that condition us and imprison us in the rat race of the consumer machine. Hamster wheels chasing price tag dreams for only 2 million trees per day. Hypnotized by the Pied Piper's tune, we are slow dancing in a burning room while they disembowel our home, our earth. Can you hear her howl? Guts steaming as they rip and tear her flesh and bone, gouge coal from her core, searching for more and more and more, more gold, more coal, more gas, more oil. Foreign countries mining on African soil, neo-colonialism, rotting red turmoil, death from the inside. It's an ecocide. Destructive. Extraction devastates communities. Destructive extraction devastates communities. Destructive extraction devastates communities. They have the right to say no to these mine dumps, these mass graves. They have a right to choose not to be enslaved. But we are afraid. We are very, very afraid.
good day. We are here. The South Devon Community Environmental Alliance is here at Sapra Shell and BP in the South Durban. And we are standing in solidarity together with the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign to launch the Climate Justice Charter. Today it will be launched on the steps of Parliament at 2 o'clock. And we are asking for a transformation. We are asking for government to adopt the Charter and to adopt the principles of the Charter because we are in a climate crisis and we need radical change. We need a divestment of fossil fuels and we need an investment of socially owned renewables, a people-centered movement and an earth-centered movement. We need to go back to nature and back to the principles of nature. We're asking for a deep just transition for to safeguard the planet and to safeguard the lives of the people affected by climate change. So join the Climate Justice Charter movement and sign the petition and let your voices be heard for a new planet and a better planet. Hi, uh, today's Friday and it's the launch of the global uh, of the uh, Climate Justice Charter in South Africa. We're at our constitutional court, a historic building, and I'm here with Fatima, a youth activist from Wits University. Fatima, why are you here? I'm here to support the Climate Justice, uh, Climate Justice Charter Movement and Climate Justice affects us all and it must come to me when we face um, major inequality. It affects us all disproportionately and therefore um, I'm here to support this movement. Dear government, load shedding is on the rise. Desperation is on the rise. Droughts are on the rise. The only thing not rising is the urgency concerning this matter. Is this still not worthy of a news headline? Or are you planning on leaving South Africa behind? Along with anyone else who cannot afford to occupy a new planet. Civilians, look at how far civilization has gone and how far gone we are. What the need to keep consuming has done. Fellow citizens, we will be left behind, overheating, possibly sinking, and ending from becoming droughts. This is a warning sign. This is a starter gun. This is an anthem written by us right now. Thank you very much for the presentation, Courtney, and a heartfelt thank you to all the activists 
today and who are still continuing right now with their actions all across the country. Um, and now I'd like to move on to the next part of our program, Voices to End Hunger, Thirst, Pollution and Climate Harm on World uh, Food Day today. And we will be hearing from constituency representatives of the Climate Justice Charter. And I would just like to say to all our reps that I will be giving you all three minutes to speak. Um, for the sake of the program. So I'll be moving. Um, I will just indicate to you in the chat, just to let you know when your time is going, just for smooth transition. And our first speaker will be Desmond Dessa from SDCEA. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, three minutes is a long time. Maybe quick. Um, I think it's important that we are taken seriously. The climate crisis is waiting for no one. We just don't have the time. We don't have the luxury to ponder. We have to act immediately. If we want to secure the present and the future, the time is now that we have to act. And we are urging our government to act immediately to secure and to protect our youth, but also our families and our communities. Our we might be left with no one. The time is right. We cannot allow hunger to be perpetrated in this country with so much wealth around us. We cannot allow longer hunger when food has been dumped all over the shelf. We have to act against the climate crisis. We have to act against poverty. And by so doing, we assist, we develop and both our families and our community as one. The time is right. Let us ensure that parliament takes us seriously and we ask the parliamentarians and the political parties here to ensure that there are public hearings that we will be able to address, to ensure that we are allowed to bring the evidence and to ensure that we ensure that the legislation that must be provided can secure the future. Let's not start, let's not ponder, and let us not delay it. The inevitable else, we might not have the future we are all yearning to have. So my advice to the parliamentarians, please listen carefully Please be part of the solution, be part of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those inputs. And next we have Francesca de Gaspari from SAFSI. Good afternoon. Thanks, Awande. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you. It's such a privilege to have the opportunity to speak on this platform this afternoon. I'm representing SAFSI, the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. And we know that uh, from our faith scriptures, all of our faith scriptures, and over 80% of us still believe, have a faith in our region, we know that the crisis that we're facing now is not something new. And just like Noah and the Ark, that faith leaders have a particular role and a particular prophetic voice during times like this. So we're so pleased that Vish and the team have recognized the role of faith leaders in our communities. Climate justice was thought of as a science issue or an issue for the economics, but actually it's an issue for all of us. It's an issue for us and justice. And faith communities and faith leaders and the, the radical root of faith is about justice. How do we hold each other to account when we see that governments and others are making decisions not in our interests? What's happened in our society is that uh, doors are closed and vested interests uh, without the light of day are busy deciding our futures. And we as custodians of this earth, we as custodians of those who are most vulnerable, whose voices we cannot hear from the earth community, it is our role, it is our responsibility, it is our right to hold to account leadership at this time to say enough is enough. Now we want to see real justice being served. No longer can you sit behind closed doors making decisions on our behalf. No longer are you allowed to just be elected and no longer think that you need to listen to the people who put you in those seats. Uh, this erosion of modern democracy is a huge problem for us. When we commoditize nature, we commoditize ourselves. And what happens is a devaluing of all forms of life. When we commoditize animals and put them in a holocaust situation, that's what we're doing to each other. South Africa has such a history of apartheid. 
We cannot allow this to happen again. We have got to take action. We've got to open our eyes and we've got to say enough is enough. So the, this is a fantastic moment. I was so pleased to see everyone uh, in the previous clip speaking out, uh, raising their voices. We have been galvanized, we are being energized, and this is just the start. So I really hope that the government is going to take our call very seriously. And if they don't, then we are going to change how things happen going forward. Now is the time, we cannot wait any longer. The science is clear. Now is the time for us to feel it in our hearts, in our stomachs and take action and not wait another day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for those inputs. And next we will have Mervyn Abrahams from the Peter Marisburg Economic Justice and Dignity Group. Good afternoon and thank you to everybody who organized this and for all those who are on this platform. Um, the Peter Marisburg Economic Justice and Dignity Group, we do our work uh, and focus really on the political economy of food. Food is at the heart of who we are. Food is at the base of all human activity. And perhaps the most important aspect of the primary right to life. And in that context, food is derived from the earth. We depend on agriculture, we depend on the climate. And so when we talk about food, the real intersectionality between climate justice, economic justice, and uh, all these other areas, social justice really comes to the fore. We know that in South Africa, we have a major food and nutrition crisis. Our organization publishes a household affordability index. And in October, a basket of 44 foods to feed a low income household of seven will cost you 3,916 Rand. That is 60 Rand more than it was at the end of September. When we look at our national minimum wage, it is, stands at 3,653 Rand. So even if an, a household gets an entire national minimum wage, they would not be able to afford the, the cost of this 44 foods in the household basket. And so what that does is it, 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 it calls on all of us to begin to think how differently we can produce our food. We have to think about more localized food systems and producing food in an agricultural way in existence with our climate that can uh, put food closer, produce food closer to where the plate of our households are. And so as the Peter Marisbeck Economic Justice and Dignity Group, we would really like to support this climate justice charter. We believe it is critical if we are serious in providing sufficient and nutritious food for all households. Actually not doing anything about, about the climate right now is actually going to be more expensive in the future. So we really need to focus on that now because it's a, it, it is not just a scientific issue, it is an issue that is directly connected to providing food to each and every South African. And it's for this reason that we call upon the state to act seriously on this matter. We cannot say that we are pro-poor, we cannot say that we are in favor of providing food for each and every South African if we are not going to do something about climate justice uh, and if we are not going to do something about local food systems. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have Rashida Muller from the South African Informal Traders Association Alliance. Sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a historic moment for me as president of SAHITA, the South African Informal Traders Alliance with a footprint across the country, to address Parliament on behalf of the informal sector. It's an undisputable fact that climate change is a real and frightening phenomenon that if left unchecked 
will spell disaster for us all. The informal sector workers are often at the forefront of climate impacts and have the least resources to cope with, even more so during COVID-19. The unsung heroes of the informal sector are waste pickers, whose role in climate change is key and incorporating them into municipal waste management could be an example of people-centered economic development. In the informal sector, which to a great degree includes and encompasses both business and communities, are particularly, we are particularly affected by virtue of our standing and dynamics within our socioeconomic sphere. For example, our fresh fruit and veg traders are being shortchanged through large food retail chains that lay claim to a limited supply of commodities caused primarily through drought. Slimmer, similarly, the high prices are having a devastating effect on our informal economies, communities. However, the ever-present greed of international corporations continues to add fuel to the fire by their pollution of the air, the earth, and the water. And we call upon our government to be much more proactive in mitigating the effects of climate change. The most astounding of all, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of climate change, is the deliberate denialists in Washington and Beijing who continue to place profits before people. Hunger and thirst stalks our informal communities because of drought in Limpopo, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape. South Africa is a water scarce country and climate change has exacerbated the situation, causing thirst, hunger, crop failure, poverty. Government have the political will to act now. I thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Ndabi Seng Matosha from Earth Life. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be a part of such a powerful movement and humbled to be able to, to relay this uh, or the importance of the Climate Justice Charter, which um, Earth Life has also signed on to. Earth Africa is an environmental justice organization that has been around for more than 30 years. We be also that we are not a voice for communities. Communities have their own voice. And we've been working um, over the years on energy and climate change issues as well as addressing the importance of, um, or rather, the brutal injustice climate change will have on, uh, uh, on, on the poor, even though they are the ones who least contributed to the crisis. So my point is for <clears throat> us as a society saying. to be able to look after... Can you, can you adjust yes. your... You are, you, are, you, are, you are lying on your side. I'm, I'm sorry to do this chairperson, but could she just adjust her oh. system so that she's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, I was just saying, my appeal today is that we actually become a community or a society that actually does take care of its most vulnerable and the poor. And I certainly believe that this is what the Charter serves to communicate, emphasizing the importance of the people, and that therefore requires us to have uh, people's welfare at the, at the center of all decision making and not profit. Um, Oftentimes, I think when we think about the climate change uh, uh, crisis, we think that is indeed the problem, but yet it's really just a symptom of a much deeper underlying issue. And that is really the system that we have created. Um, and I just actually want to say that, yes, many of us are born into the system, but we are actually perpetuating the crisis through our own choices. And we do have an opportunity now to actually change that path that we're currently on. Um, 
And I just want to completely uh, expound on this and just actually say that this system that we have created is actually based on a set of assumptions that we are, are people who are uh, driven by um, our own self-interest and by competition. And in the more extreme uh, sense of self-interest, greed. And that personally is not something that I definitely agree with, but it is essentially what is behind the idea of capitalism. And this is what has led to the exploitation of both nature and people. And so in fact, this crisis that we're facing now is actually um, around over-exploitation and nature is fighting us back. And this is why we have climate happening. Um, and what we must recognize is that we are not above the laws of nature and we must rethink our economic system um, that is actually leading to our planet's destruction. So what the, the charter is calling for is a complete system change, which we also agree is necessary for right now. Um, and those who are in this webinar right now, I also want to appeal to you and also say that we must take responsibility collectively. It starts at the individual level. It starts, um, it also goes on to the role and position that we feel in society, but also government is definitely responsible for setting us on a path of a low decarbonization. Um, and also, um, I think the charter outlines important principles and alternatives, um, as well as plans that also should include and benefit communities. Over the last uh, couple of years, I think uh, community voices have, become, have been becoming stronger, and that's also because um, uh, oh, this has been facilitated, but more than more of the digital age, and this is really pleasant to see. I think uh, it is important that we act appropriately now, um, if especially we don't want to uh, encounter great civil unrest. This is a real threat to our society as well as resource wars. Um, so, given that the people um, uh, right now are also under great oppression, um, it is um, uh, logical to think that people will lash, lash out. So. I just, I just want to end off by saying that um, I know this situation is very complex um, and it can be overwhelming, but it is also important to remember that the antidote of despair um, is action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ntabi Singh. And next we'll have Gideon Duplessis from Solidarity. Oh, thank you very much, Rwanda, and good afternoon to all and all protocols observed. Our members in the agricultural, mining and energy sectors are severely impacted by climate change and the devastation it causes to the lives of people. In the agricultural sector, our members are especially worried as they are witnessing and experiencing the harm caused due to an increase in, in uh, droughts, floods, sand and dust storms, and all of these threatens job security and food security. Mining communities, again, are exposed to various forms of pollution. Uh, in the Krill area, for instance, mining communities are exposed to extreme levels of air pollution caused by the ESCOM coal power stations and the coal mines in the area. On the energy side, our biggest challenge is with the company Sassel. Its Sin Fuels plant in Secunda that converts coal to fuel stands accused of being the world's biggest single point source of carbon dioxide emissions. This company has twice been hit by hurricanes at this uh, Lake Charles project in Louisiana, and one can't help but to think that the chickens are coming home to roost. Furthermore, in a recent report released by the PwC, the lack of effort by mining houses to mitigate the impact mining has on the environment and mining communities gets highlighted. Uh, this report also shows that mining houses are not committed to achieve the ESG targets set by themselves and that there is a lack of reporting and monitoring. Mining houses are so focused on compliance when it's required to protect their social license to operate and therefore the benefit of having a mining charter in place. But should this climate justice charter be adopted, it will force this sector and other relating sectors to raise their game and to end their climate harm. In defense of the mining sector, South Africa needs to remove the barriers in the way of rolling out renewable energy initiatives and to harness the power of green technology. For example, Sabanya Stillwater has for years wanted to install a solar array at its Griffontaine and Kluwer mines, but regulatory challenges and red tape have worked against them. On the other hand, gold fuels have just completed the building of one of the world's largest renewable energy microgrids to help power its Granny Smith gold mine in Australia. This is in stark contrast where the same company is still waiting for the green light for the construction of a similar solar plant 
that is self-demined here in South Africa. We need to fast track the energy transition because a reduction in carbon emissions is a civilization emergency. We must apply pressure on the carbon culprits. And this climate justice charter provides the pathway to save lives and livelihoods and will pave the way for a just transition for affected workers, but it will assist the process to create green jobs that will benefit the next generation. Lastly, we therefore ask our honorable members of parliament to give this charter the green light because it will serve as a blueprint for our energy transition and ensure social justice. I thank you. Thank you, Gideon. And next we have Catherine Constantinides from the Ahmed Kathadra Foundation. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Climate justice is social justice. This phrase from the Climate Justice Charter being handed over to Parliament today is perhaps the most important in the document. It sums up to the core of what our struggle as progressive activists will be over the generation, at this generation at least. The one line alone is a stark reminder of how issues of equality, justice, dignity, and peace pivot so fundamentally around the ability to safeguard the earth. Within this context of the current coronavirus pandemic, the linkages between the environment and social justice became increasingly apparent for so many South Africans. In the Eastern Cape, for example, the severity of the drought was compounded with the impact of the virus. In Burgersdorf, residents have reportedly only had access to water for seven hours every second day. To top off the bleak scenario, our government is seemingly unable or unwilling to deal with the extent of the challenges. People have been starving as a result of the lockdown, while on the other hand, government officials have been accused of food parcel corruption. While climate scientists and activists are warning about the disastrous consequences of a warmer planet, particularly for the developing world, there is no clear indication of strong enough political will or sustainable plans being put in place to deal with this impact. As the climate crisis looms, some of our politicians are to a greater extent more concerned about the fraction battle, staying out of prison and protecting their own interests. The Climate Justice Charter shows how the issues of good and clean governance are directly linked to effectively ensuring a deep, just transition to deal with the climate crisis. The Charter says that we must overcome the crisis of corporate captured political leadership, which is incapable of thinking beyond the short term. It affirms that we must strengthen our democracy, constitution, and transformative constitutionalism by claiming our right and building united people's power as we confront the climate emergency and worsening socio-ecologic crisis. These are important statements, but the challenge is ensuring that they are given practical meaning. Today on World Food Day, there are picketers and workshops taking place across the country in a bid to create more awareness and build support for a deep, just transition to move towards a fair, equal and ecologically sustainable society. Young people from the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation have been supporting the Orange Mask campaign against C-19 corruption. They picketed this morning across Johannesburg. They painted plates orange to symbolize the orange overalls that the corrupt should be wearing. And on these plates, they wrote slogans indicating that people are hungry for justice. They demanded transparency and accountability. The orange plates bearing the words, tell us who ate the money. These are activists who like most other South Africans feel betrayed that while the country has struggled under the burden of a pandemic, corrupt private and public sector networks saw the chance to steal, steal resources from the poor, the vulnerable, and from our frontline workers. We felt betrayed as we were then with the same government who tried to push through a nuclear deal just a few years ago, knowing full well that the economic and environmental consequences were real. As the threat of a second wave and an even larger threat to the climate emergency that looms, we are aware that we will face challenges that previous generations were not confronted with. And we cannot allow a state of affairs to go on like this, where the blatant disregard for the rule of law and, the ser and, and for serving the public is not challenged. If this goes on, we stand very little chance of mitigating the impact of the crisis. And we need a competent and honest state that puts the interests of the people and the environment first. This charter tells us that we are at a crossroads and it encourages us to all become activists for climate justice so that our country makes the choices 
it is it is this uh, charter that states a call to to all who care about human and non-human life to act in advancing a plural vision of people's dreams alternatives and devise and, and desires for a just and deep transition very much like the freedom charter that since 1955 has served as a lodestar against racism apartheid and inequality the climate ju climate justice charter lays out a new vision for a better society thank you Thank you very much. And next we have Hamida Didat from the National Labor and Economic Development Institute, Naledi. Hi, thanks comrades and um, all protocol observe for our uh, parliamentarians. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present um, like my comrade from the Solidarity uh, Union, an opportunity of a labor perspective. I think uh, our comrades from, the, from parliament, I think one of the first things that needs to be noted is that South Africa has been participating um, in all these UN processes, really high profile processes. We've been making, we've been writing documents, Labour's been engaging, we've been making inputs. But at the end of the day, despite the fact that the principle of a just transition, and I think from the Climate Justice Charter, it's moved into eco-socialism and a deep just transition and transformation that, we, that we're looking for, despite all our engagements, our contributions, our demonstrations of why a capitalist system is leading to us, or is, is basically contributing to us failing to meet um, the, the commitments that our government is committing to, but more importantly, it's creating more and more um, injustices and travesties on the ground. We do not see traction. Um, our Department of Environmental Affairs Minister is committed um, in, in terms of um, speak uh, around a just transition. We have discussions around a green economy. We're looking at how, you know, lots of money, even in terms of the, 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 the current stimulus, when we look at the issues of energy and um, when, when our comrades engage in NEDLAC, there's constant discussions around how the just transition is being used as a principle, um, you know, to either create jobs or to, to, to bring about um, change, but we're not seeing it. And I think why this climate justice chart is absolutely fundamental is that a lot of the key principles that we in particular as labor are, are, are supportive of, but also really and truly need in terms of changing the system so that we can see fundamental change for workers in particular in specific sectors is why this climate justice charter needs to be endorsed. There's no roadmap outside of this climate justice charter. We've been engaging consistently. We've gone to meetings. We've presented issues in relation to the just transition. And even when there was an MPC process around it, no people, different government departments will indicate, yes, we are completely committed to a just transition. But when we ask them, so what are, what are the principles? What is the vehicle? What is the way to actually get us there? Um, th then everything just falls um, apart. So I think that the key thing, and I think one of the first speakers after Comrade Bish, um, when making the opening statement and when supporting um, the Climate Justice Charter indicated that this is actually a tool. It's a vehicle that can be used in the most comprehensive way. It supports not only the voice of labor, but it has a large constituency base and, and support and buy-in, as you saw from the footage um, from community-based organizations. If we do not do something drastically, we, apart from the economic crisis that we're currently seeing and the massive bloodbath in relation to jobs and job creation, we are going to be facing an even bigger crisis. I think what, what, what also makes the Climate Justice Charter stand apart from everything else is that in many instances, even in terms of the discussions at NEDLAC, the issue of the climate science and, the, and climate in relation to the economy, in relation to its impact to jobs, in relation to how we take forward a new industrial strategy um, that, again, that begins to address not only our energy needs, but in relation to jobs, in relation to um, renewable energy, in relation to food, in terms of uh, agroecology, in terms of food sustainability. And I think most importantly, looking at the question of nutrition. I think Comrade Mervyn um, um, highlighted the fact of the, of, of the issues of malnutrition and food, um, our, our, our food security and sovereignty um, being challenged quite severely by the current system. And again, I think it was, it, it was, it was um, stated by one of the other panelists that we are calling for, and it is quite strongly articulated in the Climate Justice Charter, we need a systems change. There's no two ways about it. So comrades from, uh, from, from, from your side as parliament, if you can set the tone, if you can give endorsement to this charter and assist us, I think it would go a long way. I'm sure you've heard of Hendrina, 
the issue of Hendrina and how um, communities and, and workers who initially had work who were, who were basically the brunt of, bearing the brunt of a, a coal-based economy which is left to the, uh, you know, to, to, ab to abject poverty and impoverishment because Hendrina was closed without the just transition, without the key principles that's endorsed within the Climate Justice Charter being taken in, uh, cognizance of. I think also the fact that there's been several um, provinces struggling with water and access to water and the crisis around water, I think the Climate Justice Charter, apart from other sectors, really ac accentuates the key importance of how it is that we need to just concretely start addressing the, uh, the, the issues around um, water scarcity, noting uh, the, the droughts that, that, that keep hitting the country. So I'll leave it at that, but really a mind to, to all the comrades who participated, a mind to Comrade Vish and Kopak for all the, the work and the, and, the, and the inputs. And comrades, we'd like to say a mind to the, to the parliamentarians once you endorse this. And, and we need endorsement now. Thank you. Thank you, Hamida. And next, we will have Devine Kluter, for an activist from the West Coast Food Sovereignty and Solidarity Forum. Sovereignty and Solidarity Forum. I want to kiss friends from all over the uh, South Africa and also the government. Today, we are very excited to um, have our um, Climate Justice Charter for us, this is very important because we work on the charter for many years. Because for us as community to speak to government, they don't listen to us because we are a rural community. And if we look at our environment, it's the most beautiful part in South Africa where we get this uh, Namakwa daisies. It's so beautiful. But if you look at currently what happened, is that mining uh, companies don't care about our environment. They just damage it. And even the Minister of Mineral Resources were here last year. And for him, it was just smell the coffee. For him, it's just that mining companies can continue destroying our envi environment. For us as indigenous people, it's very important that we live next to nature. And today we demonstrate what we are facing this climate uh, charter will be very important for us so that we can, can tell government that we are serious as indigenous people because we are a group of women that do the demonstration today, marching around and say that why government leave us aside. And if we look at COVID-19, there was no, no one who come to us and, and help us from government side. The government promised us many things, even if we look at the constitution, many promises after we became a democratic country. But at the end of the day, the government are not serious. So what we as women said today to this government that we elect to be in power, that we're gonna take back our power and we're gonna use it to survive. Because if they get the power to multinational corporation and just ignore us, we're gonna make sure that we take the power back in our hands. We live in a, in a piece of la a land here in the West Coast where white farmers use the water resources. And even today, we, we, the, the temperature is very, very hot. It's more than 45 degrees. So, during the winter time with low rainfall, we, we get the water, the dam of the Glen William Dam is full of water, but all of a sudden, the, when the vineyards start, all the white farmers are extracting water from this dam. And this is where we get our water to drink. So what we ask the government through this uh, climate justice charter is put them a, a, a moratorium on using water for vineyards because we don't want to be addicted to wine. We want water to, to drink. And also we as small scale farmers need water to do agroecology to save this environment. So that, that is why we ask for the charter today to be adopted by government. Because what the ANC government says is the people shall govern. But after 26 years of democracy, we see that the ANC 
the officials govern, not the people govern anymore. So we're going to take power back. And we are serious as women because the women of the West Coast are watching today. And we're going to challenge government through this charter. From La Via Campesina's side is World Food Day. As a member of La Via Campesina and on the African, Southeast African region, we want to say viva to COPEC and South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and all the NGOs and the activists who are part and parcel in forming this charter. Because from La Via Campesina, we are, we are busy looking into a climate charter for the whole world. So we can learn from this charter throughout the, the globe. And I'm going to introduce it also when we had the International La Via Campesina gathering, because we can be proud today of South African activists that put the charter together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Devine. And next we have Nora Seneca from the Active Citizens Movement. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the honor and privilege of addressing you all today on behalf of the Active Citizens Movement. And um, I'm going to do a screen share. This is our climate change march, which we help to coordinate on September the 20th, 2019, from ICC to Durban City Hall. This is our situation in Durban, on the edge of the sea, where we face with extreme climate events, a number of which have come more and more closely together. We are in a climate emergency, and we presented our petition to the mayor's representative at the Durban City Hall. It was drawn up by South Durban environmental activists and also through the youth of Extinction Rebellion. It was endorsed by over 20 different organizations. And in the context of COVID-19, the government has failed to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. A democracy means that the voice of the people is heard. A democracy means that transparency, accountability, and answerability are important. It means protection from political and police violence. It means capable and people-centered administrations. It means service delivery on the ground and that corruption can have consequences. We're presently initiating and leading a, a, a orange mask campaign where every Friday different organizations and groupings of people in different communities around South Africa are picketing in order to get consequences for the corrupt activities around COVID-19 and other types of corruption in our country. Corruption puts profit before people. It makes our futures go up in smoke. Here are some of our um, demonstrators saying that fracking must go and no to filthy coal power. In the Natal Midlands, in our wetlands, which is the source of our water supply for our Tugela River in particular, um, fracking is being proposed. And by the way, it is Tugela water that is pumped up to the Val and used there in the Val Triangle through the Rand Water Board. So that's a warning to everyone. The heart of our industrial system will be affected by lack of fresh water. We proclaim that there should be no mining on our land without community consultation. Here we have the Amadiba Crisis Committee. Um, they're picketing around one of their court, numerous court cases because of lack of consultation again with communities about mining rights. Land is being grabbed by mining companies, particularly coal mines around the Umfalozi and the um, Lufui Game Reserves. 
here in KwaZulu-Natal. And Papeni, which is one of the areas there, it mirrors the scourge of mining-related assassinations in KZN. That's from a Daily Maverick article on the 14th of September, 2020. Of course, we know Krolo Beni, Bazuko was assassinated. Gunmen are terrorizing villages. Biela is the latest anti-mining activist in northern KwaZulu-Natal to allegedly be targeted by gun-wielding assassins in what is believed to be an assault on community activists opposed to the forceful re removal of families to make way for the expansion of mining activities under the Bukunyoni tribal authority on the north coast. Mine expansion is putting lives on the line. This is the Somkele mine. In Opondweni, women have been living in fear of their lives. They've experienced threats and shootings directed at families and individuals that do not want to be relocated by Tendele mine. They demand daily patrols at Opondweni area to keep murder attempts at bay and to feel safe in their community. Here they are at the Kwam Sane police station on 18th of May, 2020. A threat more deadly than COVID-19. By the Mfulosi rivers, the, the Mfulosi rivers, by the way, consist of the black Mfulosi and the white Mfulosi, which join together to make one Mfulosi, which runs down to the Smangaliso wetland world heritage site. And those waters are being polluted by a type of sulfate that comes from the coal mines. And the Mvalo and Tlongwani rivers have actually dried up completely from the mining activities there. People used to live very happily, be able to eat from the land, their own produce. They're no longer able to do that. Small animals are dying from the poisoned water, including little dokers and so on. And it, remember, it's right by the Umfalozi Game Reserve. The waters of these rivers run down to the sea through the Smanglisa Wetland Park, uh, where there are coelacanths in the ocean. Again, a extraordinary creature left over from the time before the time of the dinosaurs that didn't go extinct. Hi, Nora. Sorry, yes. um, we, we're going over on time. Oh, sorry. Um, move on to the next speaker before we move on to the next part of our program. Apologies. Yes. Thank you, I'll quickly finish. So to go on here, extractive industry is not development. And also, will our rivers ever have corporate rights as corporates have personhood rights? Kola Beni is there and an integrated resource plan commits our economy to coal, but we want to move away from that. Durban is choking as the engine um, for if oil refinery heats, uh, work heats up after COVID. And COVID corruption equals death. So we want Ubuntu to be put into practice and wear an orange mask on Friday against corporate corruption and the collusion with uh, government in corporate corruption. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nora. And next we have Rais Nurbai, a youth climate justice activist. Thanks, Awande. Um, I've just been taken to somebody else's screen. Okay, yeah, I've got my screen back, no stress. Um, comrades, fellow activists, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the of the earth, the revolutionary writer and decolonial thinker Franz Fanon said that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. As the earth warms, as inequality deepens, as hunger grows, our generational mission is unveiling itself before us. Now is the time for us, as the youth, to throw our weight behind the movement for climate justice. The need for climate justice is motivated by the sins of carbon capitalism. Climate change on account of human activity is a threat to the future of humanity. 
At home, our fossil fuel giants, Sasol and ESCOM, produce more air pollution than some countries, killing thousands of South Africans in the process with no repercussions. The system of neoliberal capitalism has consistently, has consistently placed profit over people and the planet. It is not that the system isn't working, so to speak. The system and its underlying ideology of indefinite economic growth is working perfectly, exploiting the environment and amassing immense amounts of wealth in the hands of a single ruling class. However, that system is failing the majority of our people, something brought into sharp contrast by the COVID-19 pandemic. The system must thus be allowed to die and a more just alternative must rise in its place. The People's Climate Justice Charter is that alternative. The alternatives proposed in the Charter are as necessary as they are revolutionary. They stress that climate justice is about ensuring a deep, just transition from fossil fuels so that those who are least responsible for the crisis are not less left jobless and vulnerable as a consequence of the crisis. Climate justice is about food sovereignty so that the people truly have control over what they produce and eat. Climate justice is about a universal basic income grant which would help alleviate poverty and precarity and address rising unemployment, especially among the youth. It is socially owned renewable energy and clean mass public transport. Climate justice, require, climate justice requires us to exercise our political imagina imagination, to radically rethink every facet of our dominant status quo. As students, we must acknowledge that our struggle for free, quality, decolonized education is linked to the struggle for climate justice. Both seek to bring commoditized goods into the commons where they belong. Both address an injustice that is structural and normalized. And both seek to liberate our country from the shackles of economic disenfranchisement and the inequities of our colonial past. Today, we are here to hand over the Climate Justice Charter to Parliament for adoption. We are here to demand an end to hunger and thirst, an end to pollution and climate harm, and an end to a system which prioritizes the interests of the ruling class above the needs and interests of the majority. While we acknowledge that this is a tremendous moment, it is certainly not the end of the movement. This much we promise. As Fees Must Fall demonstrated, the youth of South Africa is awakening. We are shedding the image of a generation that was born outside of apartheid and inside of apathy. We are tired of waiting, for we now realize that we are the ones we've been waiting for. We will not bow to myopia and greed, and we will not rest until our generational mission has been fulfilled. The era of carbon capitalism is ending. Our job is to help it die, and together we can mold a more just world in its place. Thank you. Amandla. Comrades, I my story. Thank you, Rais. And now we will have Kazan Janssen von Furen of the SCLC. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Krizan Janssen van Vieren from the Support Center for Land Change. Uh, we operate in the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, and I am based in Grafrinet in the Eastern Cape, Karoo. So I would like to make use of this opportunity to just reflect about a bit on the situation in the Eastern Cape, Karoo. Um, communities in the Eastern Cape, Karoo, um, are crippled by, by the climate crisis. Um, we've been experiencing this most severe drought ever recorded since 2015. Um, the drought was so persistent and severe that it's been described as the worst drought in a thousand years. Um, so towards the end of 2018, 2019, most of our dams have already run completely dry and that left communities totally dependent on underground water resources. But at the same time, these boreholes or underground water resources um, were also depleting at an alarming rate. Um, so at that point in time, many households in the Karoo were left without any access to any running water for extended periods of time. 
Um, and it soon became clear that our local municipalities do not have the capacity to deal with the water crisis at all. Um, so those without money, uh, without money or resources to buy water were simply left without water for, for days on end. Um, it, I have to add that at some point in time during the period that we didn't have any running water, residents of communities such as Aberdeen and Grafrinet in the Dr. Bayer's Nodea municipality had to actually pay for wind coming out of their water taps. Water wasn't coming out, wind was coming out, but the meters kept running and we had to pay for the, for the wind coming out of the taps. Um, so even though we had a little bit of rain in December um, and some of the months subsequent to December, the water crisis in this area is obviously far from over. At the moment, for, for example, our dam in Grafrinet, the, the Nueva Dam, is at a capacity of 16% and it is again running dry. Um, so it's obvious that this climate crisis and the resultant climate disasters had a, a severe impact on the communities that we work with. Um, many farm workers in this area lost their jobs. Small scale producers were no longer able to produce to sustain their families. Small scale farmers lost most of their livestock. Um, and because of the fact that they didn't have met much resources, they were just not resilient enough against this climate crisis. Um, then with our informal settlement dwellers, um, those are the communities who have been experiencing water crises even before the impact of the drought became evident in the broader communities. So they were without water even before the rest of the taps ran dry. Um, with the drought, or with the impact of this drought, they were left in an, what I can refer to an inhumane crisis situation with absolutely no access to any water. Um, I have to add also that they were also the ones whose houses or dwellings flooded during the rains in December and subsequently in the COVID-19 period, they again lost their houses when we were faced with gale force winds. And these are all, uh, these are all um, climate disasters. Um, we never experienced it before. It is a direct result of climate. Um, so in summary, I would just like to emphasize the fact that the climate crisis is killing the Karoo. Um, it, it really is killing us all. Um, and irrespective of this, our government appears to be still promoting the adoption of legislation that will allow for the exploration, production and consumption of fossil fuels. And fossil fuels obviously is one of the major contributors or maybe the biggest contributor to the climate crisis that we are faced with. Um, to make an example, the continued threat that we are faced with in the Karoo, um, where fracking companies want to come in and, and frack, irrespective of the fact that we do not have water and we cannot afford our under, underground water resources to be contaminated by fracking fluids because we are reliant on that. Um, then uh, I wonder, is that time for me? Yes, unfortunately, the, the time is for you. Yeah, just just you one mean, sentence to end off. We simply cannot afford we simply cannot afford the exploration and production of fossil fuels. We have to invest in renewable energy alternatives, and the Climate Justice Charter needs to be adopted and implemented as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Thank you, Krizan. And our next speaker is Kiran Sadgu from Veda Dharma Sabha. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, 
comrades from all parts of the country, uh, a very good afternoon to you. Firstly, I would like to say that <clears throat> it is a very proud moment to be part of this uh, conversation and, uh, and, and initiative. Coming from the faith groups, also um, like one of the previous speakers, you know, we are very, we are directed by scripture and our activities are scripturally driven. So today, being part of this whole um, request and play, prayer for the government to have a rethink and also to accept the Climate Justice Charter is something that, has, uh, that is groundbreaking and it is also a, a very, very important initiative for us in this country. You know, we say that uh, man, the most important creation of God is not alone and belongs to the family of God, consisting of animals, plants, and the whole phenomena. And as members of a family, all are interdependent and bondages of the fraternity are mutual. And just like the 50s and the 60s, when people were being made aware of mercury poisoning and various pesticides that were starting to creep into our environment. And there, thereafter, there was a lot of dialogue, but it seems like a least amount of action was being taken. And today we are very honored because we have a charter that's on the table and we hope and pray that our government will obviously look at it and should look at it and implement it. And now there is a growing awareness and a common concern in the world about the increasing degradation of our global environment, not globally only, but here locally in our beautiful and wonderful country. The developing countries, which have 80% of the world population, are burdened with the adverse effects of pollution caused by the developing countries. Yes, we've been speaking about the greenhouse gases, we have been exposed to deforestation and the eco economic ills of deforestation. And we say to ourselves, we've been reading about it, we've been seeing it, but what is being done about it? And today, the Climate Justice Charter is speaking about these things, and we support this. We're saying that besides gases and even excessive noise disturbances, the balance of the natural phenomena is at stake. It might ultimately lead to a diminishment of the world's most vital resource, and that is food. Food is something that we are, we are actually working towards at this very moment in time because of the huge poverty and the huge unemployment and the huge crisis that we are experiencing in our community. There was an interesting article that I read, and it's from a book which quote, How Much Enough? And uh, the Consumer Society and the Functioning of the Earth it is stated that the consumer lifestyle born in the West and now emulated by billions of people worldwide cause the lion's share of ecological ills. Yet consumption is usually overlooked in the environmental discussions. So according to this author, the affluence of high consumption by privileged society is also responsible for ecological ills. If the Earth's abundance is to survive for the grandchildren, we, the present generation, in the consumer society will have to adopt an ethic of sufficiency. So dear brothers and sisters and dear comrades, it is very important for us to be part and parcel of this historical moment, to endorse, to endorse the Climate Justice Charter. And I like to conclude in saying that we pray for this charter to be recognized and accepted by our government. I thank you. Thank you. And now we have our final speaker, Ayanda Kota from the Unemployed People's Movement. Right. Thank you very much, Comrade Mawande. Uh, I think in my three minutes, it's quite important uh, that I should, uh, I should thank the organizers of this meeting. Uh, but in particular, during what uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, 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 called and, 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 and named this period a politics of uh, sensational, uh, politics of media, 
and in politics of celebrity. Uh, the, the economic crisis has given a rise to political crisis that we see and witness uh, in Seneca, the right wing politics and, and the politics of fascism. It's, it's quite relieving to be part of this meeting, Comrade Mawanda and Comrade Ish, uh, to see how the democratic processes have given rise to a very important and historical document. Uh, so we are, we, are, we are quite pleased to, be, to, to have been part uh, of the development of that partitude uh, of, of this document over, over the years. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the water crisis in our townships and in Makanda, they cut deep into the fabric of, of our society. Uh, they increase hunger. You can't speak of water crisis in isolation of hunger. Uh, they intertwine, they work together. Uh, this has become our experiment, uh, our exper uh, exper uh, experience. Uh, the water crisis, the hunger and, and, and poverty. Uh, but again, in terms of your UN General Assembly that recognizes water and sanitation are essentially to the realization of all human rights. So what this charter seeks to do, it seeks to assert our humanity, it seeks to assert our dignity as people, uh, as, as, as we are demanding that the government should uh, consider the implementation uh, of this Charter, which is the product of the of the democratic processes, which is the product of, of movements, uh, unions and poor people's movements coming together and, and crafting it. Such a history, it is a very historic document. So we are quite pleased, uh, because in, in, in Makanda, comrades have spoken about the colossality of, 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 of corruption that we have also witnessed in this uh, uh, pandemic. I mean, the water crisis in Makanda has been going on for years and also in the Eastern Cape, one because of drought and, 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 and two because of the widespread corruption that in 2013, uh, Deputy Speaker, we, Makanda, Makanda Municipality uh, had a loan agreement with DBSA to the tune of 50 million rand to address the water crisis. In 2013, again, uh, Department of Water Affairs gave this municipality about 98 million rand. In 2016, Deputy Speaker, uh, we got about 180 uh, million rand from the Department of Water and, and, and Sanitation. In 2016, again, we got about 72 million that was approved for, for water treatment. In 2016, again, about 140 uh, liber uh, leverage from the Eastern Cape uh, Development Corporation. Again, in 2019, about 20 million rent uh, from MPB uh, to do the government uh, it, that entered into a government contract. Uh, this, uh, the then minister, Googling Quinty was here. But I'm saying despite that, the water crisis has not improved. That's number one. But number two, quite importantly, as I conclude, number two, quite importantly, as I conclude, we had a demonstration, Deputy Speaker, uh, in Pedi because of the water crisis. The mayor said, there's nothing I can do about water crisis. It is up to nature and it is up to God. In Makanda, the former mayor said, there's nothing I can do. I cannot control the nature. Uh, again, when we had the similar protests in Transkai, these municipalities are expected to have mitigation plans against the climate crisis, but they are not glued. They don't know anything. We hope with this document, with this charter, we, it also allow us the process to converse with these municipalities because they're in a limbo as far as this crisis is concerned. Thank you very much, Comrade Mawande. Thank you for those inputs from Anna Kota. And now I will move on to the next section on our program, but I will hand over to Prof. Vishwa Sadka, who will chair this session. Comrades, our speaker has to leave and we had to adjust this program because of that. 
So we're going to quickly share with him the climate science document and this entire assembly and the public. Uh, we are launching it now on this platform. We are going to also share with him the different versions of the charter. It's translated into all 11 national languages of the country. And, uh, and then we will sh electronically share the memorandum. Uh, Comrade Lechisa has to leave and then we will read the memorandum immediately after that. Uh, can I just call Ferial Adam to quickly share the climate science document? Ferial, are you there? Uh, uh, sorry, Comrade Vish. Yeah. I'm in trouble, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand what you're suggesting because I pleaded with you, no, no, including no. in the chat box. So it's are you fine. releasing me? We are releasing you, but what we're also doing is we're releasing all the documents to everyone. Okay, okay. No, no, no. I think this, is, yeah, this will be understood and appreciated. And especially because when we receive the, the, the recording, uh, we will make it available to the widest possible people that we are going to be engaging with so that they know what we are asking them to do in Parliament. So that's the principal reason I'm saying that I, uh, I, I'm requesting the recording as well. It is sure. not out of disrespect. I, I also agree that it was my mistake for not sharing with my office, my diary for the work that I have to do. So please allow me to run and sure. uh, I will follow through. And I have offered that we should meet at a subsequent time, mutually agreed time to discuss. Absolutely. There will be a follow-up engagement. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the, giving me the opportunity. Okay. Comrade Lechisa has to run, but we'll continue with our program. So we've just shared the climate science document. Uh, Jane, can you share uh, uh, the first few versions of the charter and then um, can Courtney do the rest? I wish I've shared the climate science document now. Everyone should be able to, to have access. Jane? Thanks, Beryl. So I am now going to share the Climate Justice Charter. Um, I don't know if you can see my camera, but this is what it looks like printed. I'm just going to share the electronic versions in the chat, the English version, the Isizulu version, the Isikosa version, and the Afrikaans version. And I'm posting that in the chat now. Excellent. Thank you, Jane. Courtney, can you uh, share with others? Thanks, Jane and Vish. I will be sharing the Sipedi version, Ndebele, Siswati, Tsonga, Setswana, and Shivenda versions. And I will also be sharing that in the chat now. Thank you, Courtney. So we have now um, officially handed over the climate science document to Parliament. It will also be sent to them by email and other forms of communication. We have now officially handed over the 11 uh, language versions of the Climate Justice Charter to Parliament. Uh, we are now going to read out the memorandum that's accompanying these documents. And this will be done by the COPAC team. Um, I think Jane is leading first. Quickly, Jane, over to you. Thanks, Bish. So this memorandum of demand will be emailed, um, also posted in the chat. I'm going to read the first section and then hand over to Courtney. So it starts off to President Cyril Ramaphosa, Speaker of Parliament, Ms. Tandy Bodices, Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Lechesa Tsenoli, and leaders of political parties in Parliament. Adopt the Climate Justice Charter as per Section 234 of the South African Constitution. Memorandum of Demands on World Food Day. End hunger, thirst, pollution, and climate harm. Introduction. On World Food Day, activists from the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, the Climate Justice Charter Movement and the Orange Mask Campaign have peacefully gathered across the country in 68 local actions informed by public health guidelines to call for an end to hunger, thirst, pollution and climate harm. We are gathered in this online assembly today to say to all political parties, South Africa cannot continue with the business as usual approach. We note the state president's economic reconstruction and recovery plan, but do not believe it represents the thinking that will ensure South Africa rises to the challenge of addressing multiple systemic crises through just transformation. Many of the strategic policies envisaged will serve a few in our country and will reproduce a carbon-based minerals energy complex that is extremely destructive 
to our well-being and ecosystems. Before COVID-19, 14 million people went to bed hungry. We have experienced one of the worst droughts in our history, now in its sixth year, with many in water stress and pollution from refineries, incinerators and coal-fired power stations continues to impact ne negatively on the health of workers and communities. All of this is connected to the worsening climate crisis, which has continued even during COVID-19. We have multiple crises that need to be tackled at once. Our state is failing the people on all these fronts. COVID-19 has exposed the deep roots of corruption in our society. Civil society, the courts, progressive media, and our academy were crucial in pushing back against Zuma-led corruption. His removal was a people's victory and rescued our democracy from complete destruction. The post-Zuma period gives us, gives us an opportunity we cannot squander. Corruption has systemic roots in the state and the economy, which we have to tackle head on with the full strength of the law if we also want to address deeper challenges facing South Africa. We have also gathered to say, no to looting society, particularly the public and private sector. Money stolen takes away from addressing hunger, thirst, pollution, and climate harm. It is cruel. Number two, end hunger. Hunger has escalated during COVID-19, and we do believe South Africa is transitioning towards mass starvation, with at least 30 million people who are in food stress. Several studies confirm the worsening crisis. The rollout of food parcels from May to September by the Social Development Department Solidarity Fund of 220,000 and other state aligned institutions amounted to 1.36 million food parcels distributed to 6.8 million people. This has been extremely inadequate to stem the tide of hunger. From food sovereignty campaign tracking work of food relief efforts, we have seen that communities have stepped up to fill in the huge gaps of government and solidarity fund failure and have risen to the challenge of feeding themselves. However, local resourcing, capacity and support is reaching its limits. We demand government considers the de democratization of its disaster management approach during COVID-19 to work in partnership with civil society and nat at national, provincial and local level, level to ensure we address the worsening hunger crisis. The distribution of food parcels by the Department of Social Development has been mired in corruption according to the Auditor General's report. We demand action by the Minister of Social Development against the looters. While government topped up grants and introduced the special COVID social relief distress grant of 350 rand, this was also too little, too late. Bureaucratic means testing impacted the role of the rollout of COVID relief grant, and instead of 9 million people receiving it, only 4.5 million have received it to date. The gains of top-up grants have been eroded by food price increases. With an essential basket of nutritious food for poor working class households, now costing on average 3,961 rand and 72 cents. This is higher than the minimum wage of 3,653 rand and 76 cents. We demand government consider carefully its approach to reversing social grant top ups, given the existing humanitarian crisis in the country, while also seriously works with civil society to overhaul and integrate the welfare system through a non means tested basic income grant system that builds on the gains made through existing grants. We want a UBIG now. While the Nobel Prize has been given to the UN Food Aid Pro Program for its humanitarian efforts, we are also concerned the UN and Food Aid Program supports globalized commercial agriculture, which is central to the food crisis in the world. We believe that the Nobel Prize should go to La Via Campesina, the largest movement on planet Earth with over 200 million members, at the front lines of defending the commons, small-scale farming, and advancing food sovereignty systems. In South Africa, we will intensify our efforts to affirm the right to food through building agroecology, centered food sovereignty pathways in communities, villages, towns, and cities. Where we break through with local government, we will secure implementation of the People-Driven Food Sovereignty Act we have developed. We reject the ANC government's approach to globalized commercial agriculture and food security, including in the state president's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Courtney, over to you. End thirst. Water inequality is a major problem for working class communities and rural communities. Before COVID-19, 54% of households did not have access to clean water from a tap. The democratic government has not rolled out the necessary water infrastructure to meet the needs of people. Besides bureaucratic incompetence and lack of planning capacity, corruption has been a central problem in the realization of water rights and needs. We commend the Minister of Human Settlements, Water Affairs and Sanitation for acting on corruption in her department. However, this problem is deep and has also paralyzed many local governments. 
The Auditor General's report have also confirmed this challenge, including numerous community struggles. We demand action against the looters of public finance in local government that have undermined the needs and rights of communities to water and other basic needs. Water relief during COVID-19 has been done without proper transparency, sustainability, and has been inadequate. After May, the National Water Affairs Department has stopped publicly reporting on its water tank delivery program, and it is still not clear which of the 2,000 communities it planned on delivering to have had such delivery. The South African Food Sovereignty Campaign has been working with 120 water stress communities over the past few months since lockdown level five. Most of these communities are in the Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape and Limpopo where the drought has continued. We demand action from the provincial and local governments in these provinces to meet the needs of these communities, failing failing which we will continue with legal action. South Africa's drought has not been handled effectively by the current government. Lessons have not been learned. As a water scarce country facing more multi-year droughts, we demand that water and sanitation infrastructure spending be prioritized to fix the water system. Again, the 900 billion rand water master plan of the minister has to be done with zero, zero tolerance for corruption and should be community led. It is also not clear if the president's economic mm. reconstruction and recovery plan prioritizes water and sanitation issues. End pollution. South Africa's air, water and soil has been seriously polluted by mining, industry, refineries and commercial farming activities. If we continue exploiting our resources as we are doing now, we could end up with a country that is akin to a wasteland. In this regard, we fundamentally disagree with the President's Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan, which calls for the current timeframes for mining, prospecting water and environmental licenses will be reduced by at least 50% to facilitate new investment. South Africa is the 11th largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world with most emissions from the country's heavy coal addiction as opposed as observed by numerous research reports. The Sassel Secunda plant alone is the largest single point source of CO2 in the world. It also produces about 190,000 tons of SO2, 150,000 tons of nitrogen oxide, 8,000 tons of PM10 and 400,000 tons of volatile organic compounds. The estimated annual health cost of ESCOM coal-fired power stations, PM2.5 emissions, is about 28 billion rand per year. Moreover, the health impacts from air pollution includes asthma, pneumonia, heart disease, and cancers, and are very prevalent in communities around polluting industries. In many instances, this is about racialized environmental injustice. In addition, the focus on mining is stealing land that can be used for farming. According to the NGO Groundwork, by 2014, 61.3% of the surface area of Mpumalanga fell under prospecting and mining right applications. This is a province that has the richest soil, which is now threatened by mining activities. If mining continues at its current rate, around 12% of South Africa's total high, high potential arable land will be ruined. The focus on mining and coal is also polluting our water from acid mine drainage, high levels of radioactive pollutants, to destroying entire river systems such as the Val, Olifants, and Crocodile that are all severely affected by salinity, which have been mainly attributed to mining activity. Given the devastating pollution impacts emanating from the carbon-based mineral energy complex and the worsening climate crisis, we demand the government stops any new projects and expansion plans of the system, including offshore gas and oil exploration, fracking, the mega coal fire power station being pushed for the Makado Special Economic Zone and other projects. In this regard, we fundamentally disagree with the state president's economic reconstruction and recovery plan, particularly the Petroleum Resources Development Bill will be finalized to unlock our country's enormous untapped potential in upstream oil and gas reserves. We also demand 
a participatory review of the IRP 2019 as it continues to lock the country into further dependence on dirty fossil fuels and will not enable a low emissions trajectory during this decade. Such a review, uh, reviewed IRP must take on board deep just transition plans from ESCOM, SASL, and other big polluters so we make our country contribution to prevent a 1.5 degree Celsius overshoot in planetary temperatures and limit the harmful impacts of pollution. Finally, we call on the Minister of Environment to implement the air quality management plan drawn up for the Mpumalanga High Felt and to also implement necessary legislative, legislative emission standards against polluting industries such as ESCOM and SASL. The last section is end climate harm. Climate science has confirmed that Southern Africa is one of 10 climate hotspots in the world. We are heating at, at twice the global average. We have to act now to prevent a 1.5 degree Celsius overshoot of planetary temperatures within the next decade, because this will mean we are heating at three degrees Celsius. At such temperatures, South Africa will experience hotter weather, multi-year droughts, extreme weather shocks, and industrial scale food production will be compromised. To help Parliament and society understand this challenge, we are sharing the attached document prepared by some of South Africa's leading climate scientists. The link will be shared in the, in the chat. We are also demanding that the Climate Justice Charter be adopted by Parliament as per Section 234 of the South African Constitution. The CJC is the product of six years of activism during the worst drought in the history of South Africa led by the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and a vibrant partner, the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center. Over the past two years, intensive dialogues have been had with key social constituencies and the public to finalize the contents of the Charter. In this regard, the CJC is truly a people's document and embodies our aspirations for a deep, just transition to achieve a post-carbon South Africa that can handle the challenges of more planetary heating. Given the urgency of the climate crisis, we are giving Parliament one year to deliberate on and adopt the Climate Justice Charter. This means we will be returning to Parliament on World Food Day, 16th of October, 2021, to get a report. This will be supported by rolling mass action by the current 220 organizations that have endorsed the Climate Justice Charter, together with individual endorsees currently at over 4,800. We will increase endorsements for the Charter through constantly messaging our demand for the Climate Justice Charter to be adopted during Earth Day, May Day, Youth Day, during local government elections and all other climate justice actions we will be engaged in. If necessary, we will take legal action against Parliament. For further information, you can contact Vish, Jane, Awande, Courtney or Ferial. Thank you. So Basically, we now have officially handed over the climate science document prepared by our leading climate scientists. We have handed over all 11 language versions of the Climate Justice Charter to Parliament, and we have now handed over our memorandum. Uh, this is now being recorded, and we will be sharing these documents and this recording uh, with uh, the speaker, the deputy speaker, and of course, all parties in parliament with our demands. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to move on the program. The program is very exciting. Uh, we are a bit constrained for time, but we're gonna try and move it fast. We are now having a debate uh, with uh, uh, three of the political parties. We have a climate science uh, input. And then of course, uh, we have um, the, the charter presented by our young people and the launch of the arc of South African life. So over to... Um, a one day. Thank you, Prof. And now we will move on to the next part of our program, uh, the engagements with the political representatives who have joined us today. Um, we reached out to all the political parties that are represented in Parliament, and we are happy to have the three who are here today. Unfortunately, the rest we're not as engaging uh, in our correspondence. And today we have from the Ngata Freedom Party member Naren Singh and representing the African Transformation Movement, Dolisa Makuba 
from the Office of the President of the African Transformation Movement. And we also have member Hanif Hendricks, uh, party leader uh, of Al Jama. And for this part of the program, we will have questions that will be brought up by our youth activists. And the youth activists will each present a specific question and then we will give uh, three minutes to each of our political representatives here today to answer each of these questions brought on by our youth activists. So um, just want to check uh, that everyone is here. Hello. Yes, Shenga, uh, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, Anif Hendricks is here. Hello, Samako is here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will now introduce our first youth activist, uh, Natalie Capso Sedaris, who will present the first question. Natalie, you may go. Greetings to everyone present. What is your understanding of the urgency of climate science? Uh, Member Singh, you may go first. Thank you very much, uh, Shanga. Thank you very much for giving Inkata Freedom Party an opportunity to participate in this very historic uh, session. Uh, I only joined year three, but I'm, I'm glad I did that because it was very, very important not to just receive a document on the charter and the science document, but to listen to the passion in which it was presented. And uh, as you had indicated, I represent Inkata Freedom Party. I want to apologize for my leader, Prince Mangosutu Mutilezi. Uh, who's uh, engaged elsewhere, but who's also passionate about the environment. And I think you're, 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 those on the platform would know well about his involvement in wildlife when he was in KwaZulu government, setting up the KwaZulu Tal Conservation Service, and then his philosophy of self-help and self-reliance. Uh, so I, I, immediately before answering the question, I just want to give you my assurance as uh, a, a member of parliament and of the fourth largest party there and the chief whip of the Encarta Freedom Party that we will certainly ensure that in parliament this charter is presented and all documents are tabled before the respective portfolio committees so we can engage and even engage yourselves. Uh, I think the, a very important question is many people don't realize that we are standing at a very important juncture in our lives as, as, as this generation. And if we don't do something about taking care of our environment, we're going to leave nothing for future generations. So, so our understanding is that it's extremely urgent to take care of the environment. And whilst COVID might have brought with it uh, uh, many downsides, uh, downside, I think it also provides us an opportunity because they say look for a hidden opportunity in every adversity. And the greatest beneficiary, as far as I'm concerned, has been the environment. We've had cleaner air, we've had more birds, we've had rivers flowing, etc. But the challenge for all of us, civil society and government and business, is how do we sustain these gains during COVID? So we place a lot of importance. On, on, on the urgency of climate uh, uh, science, as your questionnaire asked, but there's too many talk shops. You know, we've been talking about this, there have been UN charters for the last 50 years, lots of talk, lots of plans, it's time for implementation. And I'm very glad with the stance that your organizations are going to take in this regard to put pressure on government. Thank you. Thank you. And next, may we please have Member Hendricks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chi. Honorable Chi, you know, the Al Jama political party is a political party uh, that contested under a religious ticket. And we're very glad that there are a lot of faith leaders uh, who, are, who are supporting this particular initiative. It is a matter of faith for us as members of the party and the Muslim community uh, to protect the environment. The Quran says that we must protect the dunya, if I can put it in simple language. So it's a matter of faith that we have to do so. Having said that, the al political party has been very active in putting to terms municipalities who pump raw sewage into waterways like rivers and canals and the sea, uh, killing our fish and harming our oceans. In fact, uh, we've had a meeting with three professors, UCT, Stellenbosch, and um, 
uh, also University of Western Cape, all chemical, uh, uh, chemistry experts, and they told us that the sewage pollution of our waterways is worse than climate change. So while we are battling with climate change uh, in the broad sense, under our nose we find that uh, we are going to leave behind a planet for our future children that stinks. I want to put it as bluntly as that, because we seem to uh, not use the, the NEMA Act, that is the National Environment Management Act. And this is the only act of parliament, uh, Honorable Chair, where you can put an official in jail if they don't comply with the NEMA Act. And I hope that there are some activists that will actually do that and all officials of municipalities and provinces and even national parliament, hold them to the courts and charge them for non-compliance with the NEMA Act. Because if you study the NEMA Act very carefully, we will find that there is non-compliance. And we have to use this piece of legislation, Honorable Chair, uh, to put our politician to terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last we'll have Mr. Makuba. Um, thank you so much. I think the message from the president of the African Transformation Movement is that we support the, the Climate Justice Charter. But in all of that, we need to understand that the most important aspects as far as climate change is concerned is the understanding of the relationship uh, between humans and the natural world in order for us to be able to ensure that there's a swift balance um, between uh, nature and human impact. Now, if we speak of human impact on the natural environment, we can tell that it has reached unprecedented levels. And unfortunately, humans, uh, humans are present all over the continents with all of the ecosystems have been, uh, having, having been modified by human activity through habitat loss, fragmentation, exploitation, pollution, and such other things we need to be able to ensure that each and every person has got action-based uh, 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 reforms that they are uh, implementing as far as wherever they are. So we first have to speak of the usage of the energy more efficiently. We need to install clean, renewable systems, such as your solar wind and, 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 and such systems that can be able to reduce our impact on the environment significantly, significantly while lowering our, our, our energy bill. In the same instance, we need to conserve water and ensure that the energy that is used to convert water uh, is able to, 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 to be kept at bay so that whatever impact that we have on the environment is not putting further strain uh, putting further strain on the environment. We also need to reduce, reuse, recycle. Fortunately enough for all of us, these are the three R's that we all grew up with when we were in elementary school, primary school, and so forth. We were all taught how to reduce, reuse, and recycle because if you actually look at it, we're now sitting with a crisis where in 2014, we, we, we faced severe drought places that even had water, didn't even have water anymore. Our streams, our dams ran dry. And these are things or basics that we can all apply in all our spheres of life to ensure that there is uh, the preservation of the current resources that we have. And with COVID-19 being in effect, we have seen that you know, people are able to travel less. Uh, as such, you can be able to see that the emissions or the, the, the horizons are much more clearer. So let us have employers uh, giving employees, you know, the benefit of working from their, from, uh, from their own houses or from their own homes or uh, arrange for carpooling services or whatever so that we are able to keep um, such, 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 such matters at, at bay. But in all of that, I think we need to also consider near sourcing where all businesses are required, where the, the, when, when there are functions that are, are required to happen in, in close proximity. We supply such places that are close by, raw materials that are close by to ensure that whatever impact that we have as far as distance in traveling, as far as the extraction of such issues and, and, and raw materials are kept at bay. I think, um, I think I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next, we'll have our next youth activist, Tiamo Malak.
Good afternoon, members of parliament. My question is, what is your understanding of the deep just transition that is required to address the climate crisis? Can we please begin with uh, member Hendricks? I must admit that I'm not aware of uh, that uh, construct and I'm unable to, uh, uh, to respond. It's the first time that the term and the construct has come to my attention. And if the uh, activists can explain it a bit, I'm sure I'll have a response. Um, Tiamo, would you like to respond or may I please, or may I move to the, the next speaker? Up to you, Chair, um, should I? I? Very basically, the deep trust transition refers to different sectors of society, energy, housing, transport, food, water, moving away from the current system that leads to climate catastrophe toward a system where we no longer face that climate catastrophe. It's deep and it's just because it means that we include everyone, women, people with disabilities, people living in poverty, and it's deep because it covers all sectors of society. Um, next, may I please have uh, Member Singh. Th thank you very much, and thank you for that uh, deep question. <laughs> well, you know, my understanding of a just transition is, is the delicate balance between economic growth and jobs uh, versus the transition to a more green and sustainable environment. And I think there's a need for us to move from an extractive to a regenerative economy. Now, having said that, you know, sometimes we hide as government behind the whole concept of just transition, because we cannot use just transition as a means of just willy nilly destroying all our natural resources. For example, one of your speakers spoke about the issue of coal. I think coal is the biggest uh, generator of uh, pollutants in our atmosphere, and Pumalanga was cited as an example. But, you know, for a foreseeable future, at least until 2030, I mean, coal is going to be the main source of us producing energy. But having said that, government needs to ensure that they invest in renewable energy, as my colleague from ATM had said. And I don't think that we've done enough as government. But as I said earlier on, Schenger, it's, it's three political parties that are here. We are the fourth largest and the largest of the three of us. And it's going to take a lot of lobbying from all parties and for, for us to convince government to change the way they operate. If you look at just transition and the concept, every government should have a budget that is commensurate with ensuring that you climate justice is taken seriously. And if you look at the amount of money allocated to, well, for example, say the Department of Environment, uh, EFF it's called, but it's not that EFF, Environmental, Forestry and Fisheries, <laughs> uh, you, you will find that it is, it, it, it is not commensurate with what a first world country would allocate to the Department of Environment. We've got legislation, there's no enforcement. You have factories willy-nilly. One of your colleagues spoke about the uh, Durban South Basin, which is a huge problem for us. So we need to, while we ensure that we can sustain jobs for the future, we must not do it at the expense of harming and destroying this God-given environment and natural resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Makuba? Um, thank you very much. I think the most important thing that Honorable Singh touched on is the ability for us to be able to strike a balance between uh, a, a, a development as well as, you know, the harnessing or the, the, the extraction of energy. So in addressing um, this issue, we need to be able to ensure that climate change demands um, are able to strike a balance in everything that we do. So we need to shift from an extractive, as Honorable Singh has also alluded to, earlier um, from an extractive economy to ensure that we move over to a regenerative economy, which will ultimately approach production and consumption cycles holistically and in a waste-free manner. But in all of that, the transition needs to be just and equitable, redressing the past harms and creating relationships of power to the future or for the future 
uh, through reparations. Now, we also need to be able to ensure that we charter an exemplary inclusive economy that is different from the current capitalistic one that we have, which serves to place profits over the livelihood of South African citizens. So this also requires that we all take a stand against corruption, maladministration, mismanagement, while at the same time building a new economy, which will also ensure that the impoverished locals of South Africa have the say, or have a say rather, in how the economy is run and it is redistributed as well, as far as they are concerned. So these reforms that we need to be building and all of these arrangements and agreements that we built, they must be in the sub-Saharan African context so that they factor in our unique needs for global finance and as well as support to ensure that we, we, we respond to climate change. So the most important thing as EATM, as we are saying is that while we are shifting from, 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 from creating an extractive economy, we need to make sure that each and every South African citizen takes ownership as far as climate change is concerned. So meaning that they are able to, 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 to have a say in how the economy is run so that they can be able to have uh, community-based projects that they are working with and to ensure that the economy benefits them as far as everything else is concerned. So I think the most important one is economically uh, uh, ensuring that the reforms that we built are, 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 are informing the steps that we want to implement. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we will have Munira Katongole who will ask the next question. Members of the National Parliament of South Africa, on behalf of the people of the Republic, my question is based on the premise that we have seen a leadership crisis on Thank the international you. scale and even on the local scale where we experienced the worst drought in a thousand years. What are your parties doing to address the leadership crisis so we can effectively combat the climate crisis? Thank you. Shango, are you there? Hi, can you can you hear me? I, yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, uh, I didn't know you, you were going to ask somebody else to respond. Can, is Mr. Makuba is frozen? Uh, then Mr. Singh, you may go. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, leadership is, 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 is a cardinal issue in any country around the world. And we've seen leaders abdicate their responsibilities. But the first thing leaders have to do, which is what we do as, as a political party with our leaders, is to admit that there is a crisis. There is a serious crisis in our respective countries. But I think a classic example of a, a leader abdicating his responsibility far away from here is USA, where, you know, uh, a country like the USA pulled out of the climate, uh, Paris Climate Accord. And that does, doesn't give uh, one a sense of uh, international camaraderie in dealing with these issues. Because it's fair enough, it would be good enough for us on the tip of Africa to have policies in place, to have civil societies and all of us working together when other countries around the world which need to commit because they have the resources as well. They need to commit those resources to enable us uh, to be able to uh, have ameliorating uh, initiatives in place. But I, I, I think it's important that uh, to re recognize that the environmental issues, as I said earlier on, has been playing second fiddle uh, to many other issues. Our technologies are not coherent with uh, ever renewing technologies. And you speak about water, uh, uh, comrade. The, the fact about water is I, I feel we have enough water in our country. We may not have enough that we need, but we are not conserving, conserving and harvesting that water enough. If you look at the dams that we have, and, and, and I live in a rural area, you'll find that the dam is 90% silted all the time. So when you get good rains, what happens? You're not conserving that water to be able to reticulate it to communities. And if you look at the corruption that we've had in the Department of Water Affairs, all the billions of rand have been allocated to that uh, department uh, to provide water and sanitation to communities. I mean, it shocks one. 
that that happened. And we're glad that there are uh, organizations like the Office of the Auditor General and other Chapter 9 institutions uh, that, you know, uh, point these things out to us. And, and we must make sure that those who are responsible for stealing taxpayers' money, especially where that money should be used to provide essential services to our communities, should be put behind bars. And I think we need committed people in government to be able to execute the policy and the plans that we have, and then we can have implementation of water and, and other socioeconomic needs. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hendricks. Uh, Makuba, you may go next. Singh. Singh. Sorry, Member Singh. Uh, Mr. Makuba, you may go next. Uh, Paul, I wonder, I've got internet connectivity issues, so if I keep on disconnecting, please just bear with me. I think the most important discussion that we need to have is that South Africa is a developing country, and as such, um, times such as the pandemic are, are, are showing certain gaps within the, within, the, within the responsibility of all of the leaders that we have in, in, in South Africa. So we've got a standing responsibility as the society, not only as political parties, of ensuring that we balance acceleration, the acceleration of economic growth and transformation with the sustainable use of environmental resources and ensuring that we respond to climate change in a manner that will mitigate the risk that it has already posed to the socioeconomic conditions of this country. Now, it's very important for us to ensure that in this discussion, we rope in all of these organizations such as yours and, and many other legs of, of governance to ensure that we all form part of the of the of the of the conversation that we're currently having, for instance, right now. Because if, if not so, we will experience again what happened in 2014, where areas such as Ikwakwa, Warden, Elliot, Ngomaz, in Northern Cape, and many other, many other areas were affected by climate change. And that also trickled on food security, which was also heavily, heavily, heavily affected due to the farm taps running dry, thus affecting the gap between the supply and demand and food quality as far as everything else is concerned, as far as e -e supply chain is, and, 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 and the, supply, the meeting of it e demands nationwide are concerned. So we need to be able to take an active stand as the society, not only to, 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 to abdicate our, our right to be able to be sound and staunch leaders. So meaning that as political parties or as the ATM, we, we, we need to be able to, to, to say that in all the reforms or all of the policies that we have, for instance, we are fighting for the phasing out of fossil fuels. I think one of the speakers alluded to the fact that fossil fuels are one of the major contributing factors to, to climate change. And we need to tap into um, alternative uh, 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 sustainable energy sources, such as your solar and your wind energy. But in the same instance, we need to be advocating actively so for the climate finance in South Africa to be in the context of the South African, uh, South African citizens. And it must also be in line with the African states that are all together in, 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 in Africa. So if we're looking at Africa as a wholesome, we need to be able to have a consolidated approach as far as the climate, uh, climate change is concerned. And in the same process, restructure the Clean Technology Fund to ensure that it fits the unique demographics of South Africa. So I don't necessarily think that even though we do have a leader Leadership, um, a leadership crisis in South Africa, but we've got many people that are able to stand and take an active, an active stand against the, 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 the mismanagement of funds, the mismanagement or non-implementation of all of these issues and laws and regulations that have been set of, uh, aside for us to be able to ensure that there is implementation. And in the case where there are non-implementers, we need able to have recourse for such non-implementers and hold them accountable. I think it was Honorable Singh, if I'm not mistaken, who, and who talked about uh, 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 the non-implementers being, being, being taken to task and ensure that as far as the leg legislation is concerned, standing legislation is concerned, what are we doing, not only as political parties, but what are we doing as society and, and as civil movements to ensure that there is implementation? Now, this is why we are gathered here today to ensure that this charter is able to be, to be, to be, to be tabled out in parliament. And I think I appreciate the opportunity for us to be able to be standing here and giving our input as the ATM. Thank you so much. And finally, may we please have Member Singh, I mean, sorry, apologies, apologies, Member Hedges. 
Thank you, thank you very much. Mr. Singh represents me on the Chief Whoops Forum. He represents <laughs> us all over and have any problems. Uh, you know, Mr. Singh is there to help, very helpful person. However, uh, let me cut to the chase, Mr. Chairman. We have a Minister of Environmental Affairs, and you may want to attach a Minister of Water Affairs because the two uh, functions are very closely related. Then we have the blue scorpions that look after the ocean, and we have the green scorpions that look after the vegetation. And then lastly, we have nine uh, directors, provincial directors of environmental enforcement. And then we have nine MECs in charge of the environment. So that is the leadership. So the leadership obviously uh, uh, is failing us. And I've locked horns with the Minister of uh, Environmental Affairs in Parliament. And I called her a blue, uh, 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 blue scorpions and um, green scorpions, lame ducks. They're not doing their work. And we are aware of the fact that over the last five years, at least five billion rand has been looted that was meant for improving environmental matters. So now to catch up on that five million, and most of it was in the Western Cape. You see, Honorable Chi, you know, when it comes to looting, Looting is not uh, uh, limited to one political party. They all uh, work together at all three tiers of government. And the pitchy for me and the pitchy for you. So that's how it works, so that everyone covers up for themselves. So as far as environmental challenges are concerned, we need to recover that five billion rand. Just imagine what we can do with regard to all the environmental uh, challenges that we have. You have a situation where the Director of Environmental Enforcement issues a directive and then his MEC uh, who belongs to the political party uh, that is harmed will rule against his directive. Our political party, we are aware of the challenges because when it came to Masupumaleli near Kailitsa, uh, sorry, Mr. Mulele, uh, uh, near Fisub, near the Simon Sam Naval Base, and uh, Sunfle near Kailitsa, we, we, we had uh, a, a settlement agreement with a public protector, so we went through that process. We had four directors against the city of Cape Town from the uh, uh, Director of Environmental Enforcement, and as soon as they said they would take it on review, he bailed out because, you know, they don't, uh, the city of Cape Town has immense uh, legal support and money to take on any, ma any matter under review. So the bottom line is the environmental harm caused to, especially to African children who sleep in sewerage, who eat in sewerage, who learn in sewerage, uh, 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 continues uh, unabated. So yes, the question is very relevant. There is no leadership. The leadership is fraught and the leadership stinks. And I don't know what we're going to do about it. We, if we are going to address these environmental issues, uh, we need to start engaging the people that I've mentioned. And it's a pity that none of them are here on this particular forum. Uh, Mr. Singh has promised his support. I will also table a question to the ministers and share the document with them and ask them what their first round thinking is on the document, so it is not filed away. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Member Hendricks. I just want to thank you all for engaging with us here today. Um, just seeing due to time, we must move on to the next part of our program with the presentation from the climate science uh, aspect of this program. I want to thank you, Member Singh, Mr. Makuba, Member Hendricks, for giving us your time and engaging, and I hope that you'll stay for the rest of the presentations, particularly this next presentation. Uh, and now I'd like to hand over to Farrell Adam, who will chair the upcoming session. Thank you. Thank you, Awande. Um, I'm going to just, we, we're not, we, we, we actually pressed for time. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Engelbrecht immediately. And just to ask Professor if he could please keep his talk to 10 minutes. Uh, given our time constraints. Sorry for that. Uh, I do apologize, but thanks anyway. Yeah, over to you, Professor. 
Many thanks, Ferio. Now I fully understand. Let me share my screen immediately and then I'll jump into this science talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start by commending Professor Satka and all the colleagues and activists that were involved in drafting the Climate Justice Charter in the sense that the document is indeed based on the most up-to-date climate science. And I think it is, it's really great that the mainstream climate science is being taken very seriously in this process. Specifically, I'm just going to give a very brief overview now why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2018 identified our region, Southern Africa, as one of about 10 climate change hotspots worldwide. So why are we so vulnerable compared to most other countries? And I'll start by showing this map. It shows the temperature records that were broken last year, 2019. In dark red, you can see that our entire western half of Southern Africa broke its longest, broke, broke its long-term temperature record. So 2019 was the warmest year ever in the entire Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and Western South Africa. Now we nowadays often see temperature records being, being broken in Southern Africa. As you've heard already from Courtney earlier today. Our region is warming up twice as fast as the world on the average. Now, just to make to be sure everybody is on the same page here, yeah? the last five years are the warmest years on record globally. If we make a list of the 20 warmest years that ever occurred, 19 of those occurred in the last 20 years. So I'm sure specifically the audience I'm speaking to today will definitely agree that we are certainly living in the days of global warming. Now, what is it going to bring to our country? As we've described in the climate science document, Professor Sadka has now already presented to Parliament. Um, before we speak about drought, we should not forget about the fact that our region is also sometimes affected by devastating floods. Um, I'd like to point out to both the activists and the members of Parliament that in 2019, our region experienced the worst flood disaster in its historical record. So when tropical cyclone Idai made landfall at Beira on the 14th of March last year, more than a thousand people lost their lives. That was in Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe. Now, unfortunately, these types of storms are likely to increase in our region as the climate system continues to warm up. That is a finding of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published back in 2018. And in fact, in the last 15 years, we've witnessed for the very first time category four and category five type hurricanes, as the Americans would have called them, in the Mozambique Channel and in the Southwest Indian Ocean. This is a real risk in the first place for Mozambique, but these systems can also make landfall further to the south. So it, they can occur over Maputo and they can occur over northeastern South Africa, the Limpopo River Basin, the, uh, the Richards Bay area. Um, these parts of South Africa are also at a direct risk for the landfall of these systems in a changing climate. Of course, our main risk is drought in Southern Africa. Many speakers have addressed this, this today already. Let me just point out very briefly, the 2015-16 El Nino drought is indeed the biggest drought we've ever experienced over the central interior, the Free State and Northwest provinces specifically. The Valdan dropped to below 25% during that drought. Um, this is a so-called multi-year drought. It lasted for about four years in a row. Um, over the central interior. The Cape Town drought is yet another example, 2015 to 17. And as we've heard today, right now, the Eastern Cape 
and also the eastern half of the northern Cape in South Africa is currently still in a state of extreme drought and in the grip of such a multi-year drought. Now, unfortunately, climate change science tells us, as you will see in the climate science document, that the risk for these types of droughts have already increased in South Africa, and they will continue increase for as, to increase as long as the climate system continues to warm. This, this graphic just formalizes the statistics. You also read, can read more about this in the report, but the main result here is that those values that you can see on the color bar, color bar show the rate of temperature increase detected in Africa over the last five decades. The startling finding is, in Western South Africa, temperatures are increasing at more than two degrees Celsius per century. In the East, it's about two degrees Celsius per century. And in Botswana, we find the largest rate of temperature increase in the entire southern hemisphere, except for some parts of Antarctica. Their temperatures are increasing three times as fast as the global rate of temperature increase. This is all because of the very unique climate system of southern Africa in the so-called subtropical parts of the world. Okay, I need to finish up very quickly. I'll just mention that right now, unfortunately, the IPCC report had to point out in 2018 that the countries of the world have not yet taken the climate change mitigation action we need to restrict global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That means we are now heading towards exceeding that threshold in 2030 or somewhere in the 2030s. And that will bring, bring a range of dangerous climate change impacts to the world. What do we need to prevent this? Well, globally, if we look at all the nations of the world in combination, we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions with 45% by 2030 if we want to stand the chance of avoiding dangerous climate change. That is the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold being exceeded. Then we need to follow up on that. And by 2050, we need to reach net zero emissions globally. So just think what that means in terms of South Africa and our own energy dependence on coal, if we want to be a contributor to the global effort, and if we want to contribute our fair share. So the last three slides, I'm just briefly showing projections of climate change in our region. I think um, the activists and the members of parliament may be happy to hear that climate change modeling, the science of making these projections has also been dec decolonialized in recent years. And now we can now just generate these projections, detailed projections of climate change in our own region, thanks to the so-called Center for High Performance Computing, which is um, a computational center under the auspices of the Department of Science and Innovation. So we use these mathematical models to make the projections of the future and the projections of a different mitigation scenarios. So right now, unfortunately, we are following a low mitigation pathway denoted by the black line on that graph. But what we are trying to get to is a Paris Agreement type future where we greatly reduce carbon dioxide emissions into the future as you can see depicted by the red line in the graph. So I think two more slides and uh, I'll conclude. I have to point out today to everybody that unfortunately our region is not only projected to become drastically warmer, it's also projected to become generally drier. On this slide, you can see some of the very, very uh, most recent projections of climate change generated through the IPCC processes. And what you can see is that our region in the subtropical parts of the world is projected to become generally drier. It is not something of the far future, it's happening already. And this specific map shows the, the reductions in the rainfall projected for 2021 to 2040 compared to our so-called natural climate. And that pattern of drying, unfortunately, only continues into the future. And if we cannot turn around the climate change, uh, the global warming process by strong mitigation, the future is devastating. Already by the middle of the century, it will become extremely difficult for our maize crop to be sustained because of the reductions in the rainfall and the more frequent heat waves. And the impacts are likely to be far wider than that into our agricultural sector. 
please see the details in the climate science document. And this is a projection of rainfall and temperature changes in over Katsi Dam. So what is a real concern is that our mega dams in the east are also projected to increasingly receive less and less rainfall as we move from the present day deeper into the future. And at the same time, these drastic increases in temperature will result in more evaporation from the mega dams. Let me point out today that it is not impossible at all that the Gauteng province in South Africa, which depends on these mega dams for about 50% of its water, can experience a day zero event. This type of drought is becoming more likely as a consequence of global warming, not in the far future. The risk already exists today, and it will be higher over the next 10 to, 10 to 20 years as the warming accelerates. So to conclude, um, main take home point today from the climate scientists is that it is important to realize that our region is warming up about twice as fast as the global rate of warming. This means that if mitigation fails, we will see temperature in increases in the order of three to four degrees Celsius in South Africa as early as the 2040s. Our climate system has already warmed by about two degrees Celsius. We will face increasing risks from high fire danger days and very hot days and heat wave days. This threatens agriculture, it threatens our cattle industry, but it also directly threatens human health. When a big heat wave strikes, the elderly is immediately vulnerable. And if you are not having access to cool water and your children are not there, are not there to help you, heat waves are life-threatening events and the risk of these events are increased. Perhaps the biggest economic risk we have to face and prepare for over the next decade, it can happen as early as that, is a day zero event in Gauteng. The, the, the impacts will be devastating. And then, of course, I've, I've spoken about the possibility of tropical cyclones making landfall more frequently over Mozambique, but also northeastern South Africa. So let me then conclude by saying that it is very important that we apply pressure within South Africa, but also that South Africa applies pressure internationally through the United Nations climate change negotiation processes, that we see a much, much stronger climate change mitigation effort over the next decade, um, globally, but also in our own country. And then, of course, as Southern Africans, we need to have very, very strong focus on the climate change adaptation effort in our region, because there's a range of impacts that we have to prepare for and that we will have to deal with very likely in an increasing way over the next one to two decades. Thank you, everybody. I hope this was a, a very concise climate change science interview uh, overview. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's always really insightful to hear um, the science, and it's scary as well. Um, I'd like to hand over because of time and we're almost at the end of our pro uh, program. So I'd like to hand over directly to Courtney, who will uh, uh, play a recording of um, the Climate Justice Charter for those of you who have not seen it yet. Thank you, Feriel. Um, I'm not going to take too much time, but this following video was um, put together by a filmmaker in Cape Town and it involves um, young people reading out the charter, young activists reading out the charter in various languages. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it. So I'll just be sharing my screen. As Africans, we live together on a vast and beautiful continent where the human story began. All of us are linked to the first human who walked upright, dreamed, thought and coexisted with plants, animals, rivers, oceans and forests. Today, this common humanity and its future is in serious danger. South Africa cannot ignore this challenge. The continued use of oil, gas, 
and coal to power our economy and society is making our world unlivable for all life. Umhlaba ulinyazwa esimo esibeka phambili inzuzo ngaphambi kokuphila. Unyaka ngamunye amazinga okushisa ayanyuka okunemiphumela eyinhlekelele. Ukunyuka okungu 1 degree Celsius kwezinga lokushisa le planet kusukela ekuqaleni koshintsho lwezezimboni. Yonke into ishintsha ngokushesha ukwanda okuthusayo kwesimo sezulu esibi okufana nezomiso izikhukhula imililo yequbula izinkanyamba izishisandlu ukuwohloka kwesimo sezemvelo ukunyuka kwamazinga okuphakama olwandle ndawonye nezincindezi ezinkulu ezimisweni zomhlaba We are sad because the future with a stable climate is being lost. Our recent drought has taught us that lesson. We are angry because our rulers are not listening. The inequality and suffering of our people, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, has worsened. Yet, we are hopeful because climate science is on our side. Like the science of COVID-19, climate science is calling for caring action now. This charter is a call to all who care about human and non-human life to act together in advancing a plural vision of people's dreams, alternatives and desires for a deep, just transition. Mines, refineries, waste incinerators, airlines, cement industries and cars have brought pollution, illness, poisons and suffering to our communities. Chemical-based and export agriculture contributes to various diseases, yet we have rallied. With lessons learned about these harms and the importance of the life-enabling commons, land, water, biodiversity, energy, earth system and cybersphere, we continue to advance our commitment to justice, anchored in people's power. Hence, we consciously choose to end the war with nature. In Tlekele Inga Paya Eyo Tusa kunye nezinto eziphilayo nendawo ephila kuyo iya kukhokhela kwinhlekele engakumbi kunye nobhubhane ongapha ya kubantu abaninzi ingakumbi abasebenzi abahluphekayo kwabakhubazekileyo abangenamhlaba nabasechingeni ezi ayizondlekele zendalo nje kodwa zingunobangela wokusilela kwenkokheli njengoko sikhusela ubumi bendalo kwaye siphila kwimozulu engakwekumgangatho Owehlayo sifuna ukuphelisa ukungabikho kobulungisa kuhlanga udidi usini nakwezinto eziphilayo kunye nendawo eziphila kuyo ngeke siyeke abafazi kunye nabantwana ibe ngabo abachatshezelwa yile nhlekele njengaphambi kwe COVID-19 nasebudeni bayo imisebenzi yasekhaya eyenziwa ngabafazi abahlala kwindawo ezihlelelekileyo nokuzinikela no kwabo kune kune galelo ukunciphisa ukuhlupheka ngonxa amadoda eqhubeni phambili ngokomoya a quals to vrye gemeenskap en doeltreffende lewens ondersteuningstelsels beteken bevrydering van hierdie ekomoordstelsel vir almal ook vir toekomstige generasies hierdie is 'n strijd van ons tyd en ons historiese taak as Afrikaners as mense en as deel van die wyerlewende aardse gemeenskap. Chapter 2: Goals of the Charter. This charter aims to advance an awareness that we thrive and coexist on one planet. Earth is a common home for all species. Thus, we seek to affirm our role and responsibilities as guardians of our planet's ecosystems and the delicate web of life it supports. Inspire a break with the thinking that caused the crisis and that reinforces the obsession with growth, progress and domination. The power of humanity is constrained by the limits, cycles, tipping points and boundaries of all ecosystems. More of the same thinking that harms Earth is forcing it to react with a power we cannot match. Reconnect with an Earth-centered conception of what it means to be human. Nature is endless and we are just one small part of it. 
We have to appreciate that every element of an ecosystem has an intrinsic value and must be respected. Deepen cooperation. We thrive most as humans when we express solidarity, share, live slowly, are free, affirm our needs and preserve the foundations of our life world. The time to challenge and to end the selfish, greedy, competitive, violent and conquering consumption of the human has arrived. Overcome the crisis of corporate captured political leadership, which is incapable of thinking beyond the short term business as usual games and which fails to understand the root causes of the problems. We reject the false solutions that prolong the use of carbon and perpetuate the unjust life destroying system. Strengthen our democracy, constitution and transformative constitutionalism by claiming our rights and building united people's power as we confront the climate emergency and worsening socio-ecological crises. Imitetu siseko yengupo enzulu enobulungisa. Uluntu ngalunye ilali itolopu isikaiko nenda uyo kusebenza kufuneka zise pambili inguku enzulu enobulungisa ukukunisekisa uchincho kubudlelwane obupakati komtu nezinto abandanyeka kuzo. Lemite tu siseko ilandilayo, kiza kukokela ezi nye injela, ama taebo kunye nengkubo kukupeki sele kuingu kwa enzulu yu ulungisa kuluntu luetu. Ubulungisa kwe mozulu. Abo bange na chala, mabango nzakali iso wakanyi batuali ukandu value mbembelelo ze mozulu. Yonke lonto ke imfuno za base benzi za abo batupekayo, za bange na mshaba, za bakubaze kileyo, za bafazi ya banga tatindueni, za banduana kunye nolundu onishirile kileyo, kufuneka zibengu ndoko wengu enzulu, enobulungisa. Enzuzo zo chincho kubuhilwane obupakati kwa mtu nezindu abanja neka kuzo. Kufuneka kwa beluani ngazo kwa kulungileyo. Ubulungisa, Ekushalin. Ubulungisa kwi mozulu, ubulungisa ekushalin. Ukuchonga na nazo zonke intobo zo talu talulo, kunye nengu nezelu ezi ngolo menenu shanga, utiti, isini, ubuni, neminyaka. Ukufumana ubulungisa kwi mozulu kunye na sekushalin. Ukupila unengalabu, emanja, gemiba yoku singunileyo. Ukupila ubomi obulula na bupoli leyo kentela ekwenza ubene nkalabo emanja ngemiba yoku singongi leyo. Ekukonda yoku bangwele kwa zozonke intobo zobomi. Ukumanyana intonipo na no kukatala. Inkakaeba kwi demokrasi. Yonke imi kakongubo ye mozulu kunye ne yenguku enzulu enobulungisa kufuneka ibeno lwazi ngezi mvo. Imvu meno mfuno za bobongi abantu inga kumbi abo bachongene no kwenza kala. Ubunika zibomparati. Ezi ndawenzo kusebenza na semparatin. Amanda abantu kufanele aboniso ngukulawulo okubonisa inkululeka no ubunika zi. Okutlanga nise nezi nsiza. Zomparati okulilegila. Ama biznisi ama lunge lafanayo okusebenzisa umhlaba. Ubunika zibomparati kanyo no kutlelo kutinga kumbamba ikaza. Okutlanga nise okumbamba ikaza esabelweni sezmale. Ema dolo baneni na sema dolo beni. Uguze kukunise kiso gula ulo kutlanga nisiwe kwe zindo nezi miso ezi fano ezi nikezo kupila. Umbamba na lwa mazo mklaba. Umzabalazo wawo wonge umto unga umzabalazo otlanga nyeluayo wogu londo lozo kupila. Emo kwe niwe zindo ezi tusayo ezi konde nene simo sezulu. Umbamba no lwa mazo mklaba lubalule kilo oso oshinchinchweni lobulungisa olu kilile njengo ba luchloselwe ukutlanga nisa bonke abaluele nkululeko kanyo no mklaba onge nayo ikopen. Klonialistisa, nyu klonialistisa en imperialu urgeseng dreif ons tot vernietigen. Dus is gekrond op die aanbidding van ongening, technologie, finansies, geweld en markte. Ons sal ons aktief van hier die stelsel losmaak, omdat ons bevrijdende verhouding tussen mense onderling en met nie menselike natuur, soos gewortel in ons geschiedenis, kultuur, kennis en die weierstrijd van die onderdruktes op planeet aarde bevestig. Intergeneratie gerechtigheid, sorg vir ons planetaire gemeenskapelike groet en ekosysteme is 
onontbeerlijk voor onze generatie rechtvaardigheid om de toekomst voor onze kinderen te jeugd en die wat nog geboren moet worden te verzekeren. Ama systeem u asugile o shincholungu kuko. Si pega na nezi mo ezi ptai ezi ningi. Kodwa isi mo ezi ptai ezi kondene nezi mo sezulu. Iso na ezi ingozi enkulu. Kogu pega na nezi mo ezi ptai ezi kondene nezi mo sezulu. Ezi tinta yonke indo. Singa kwazi uktutugisa ezi kazululo za zozonke ezi indo ezi ptai. Ezi kondene nezi ezi ntalo. Futi ngogu vamile si kete impi nenvelu. Ama sistimu ashugile, aya tingeka, uguze sipeka nenezi mbange lazo shincho, oliko nene nesimo sezulu. Izingo zizalu, nezi ngende zizokuti ama sistimu awe. Ogu kona, ogu shugile, ogu nga sechenzi swanjenge zintozo kubasa. Ezi nga kwazi ukushanga beza na nezi tingo zetu, ezi isisekelu. Kututuki swe umtamo wetu, ogu peka na nezi ntlegelele zemvelu. Futi silungiselelwe ukuthi sikhiqize kabusha ama sistimu asekela ukuphila ama sistimu ahlukile anjalo acatshangiwe futhi ayingxenye yomzabalazo wabantu wokuqeda i-carbon emphakathini manje njengengxenye yoshintsho lobulungisa olugxelile sizibophezele ukuthuthukisa okuhlukile okunjalo kanye noshintsho loma sistimu enkululeko angezansi Izintelo zenkululeko no shincho lobulungi sa olu kalile. Izintela ezu suka pezu luzie eza anzi zo shincho lobulungi sa obu kalile zikabanga ukuti abantu abakwazi kuzikabangele. Futi abanazo izimpendulu. Nda wonye, wonke umpaka atinenda oyo kusebenza itinga ukututuki sa ushelo lo shincho lobulungi sa olu kalile. Lo kukufanele kwenzi wengenle la enkululeko. Uguze kufunyelwe ushincho lo mandla lo kukeda i carbon. Kui lapo kuslanga chezwa na nezitingu ezi balilekile. Futi kututuki iso ama sistimu ashukile. Imi komo nezi miso njengo bazibekwe kulo kulo mteto sisekelo. Socially owned and community based renewable energy through a rapid phase out of fossil fuels. Our dependence on coal, oil and gas has to be ended as it is accelerating climate breakdown, ultimately leading to an unlivable world. Nuclear energy is dangerous and costly. Instead, we will advance socially owned and community-based renewable energy systems, such as solar, wind, hydro and tidal power. Supported by participatory budgeting and incentives such as feed-in tariffs for our workplaces, homes and communities. Such energy technologies must be industrialized in South Africa using renewable energy. Efficient use of energy and technology will be crucial in this transition. Divestment from fossil fuels, an, es an end to fossil fuel subsidies and an end to extraction, such as fracking, more coal mines and offshore extraction are imperative. All big energy generators, such as ESCOM and SASL, have to commit to deep, just transition plans to secure the interests of workers, affected communities and future generations. Feed ourselves through food sovereignty. The current industrial food system produces hunger, uses water inefficiently, destroys nature, releases carbon, and is generally unhealthy. Commercial fishing has destroyed marine ecosystems and undermined the rights of subsistence fishers. Every community must prioritize small-scale agroecological farming to meet local needs. The right to food must give food producers small-scale subsistence fishers informal traders and consumers the power over their own food common systems to ensure that culturally appropriate and nutritious food is available to all. Moreover, biodiversity, control of seeds and resources for production need to affirm the importance of indigenous knowledge, local markets, control of the water commons, the eco-social function of land and good health. Big farms need to be deconcentrated to ensure land justice but in a manner that is fair, strengthens reconciliation, and builds solidarity. Democratize the water commons. Water is controlled by a few, while many are in desperate need. Industrial farms, mines, coal-generated electricity, sugar and timber plantations are some of the major uses of water. As a public good, water needs to be conserved by all, and it must be protected from pollution. 
Furthermore, water use has to be democratically planned and effectively regulated while affirming citizens' rights to consume this scarce and pre precious resource. Water and sanitation infrastructure must be upgraded, managed and monitored to ensure efficient use. Water savings from phasing out coal generation and big industrial scale farming will enhance the water commons. A water conscious society has to be prompted. Jabule lugu pila ngogu sebenza kanane. Ugu sebenza kwa wawonke umtu njenge ndele yoku pila futi atole iholo akuna sa kwenzeka. Ugu nga sebenzi imi sebenze hole la kanane kanye na maoro ugu sebenza amate alimaza umpagati. Emtlabe no shisayo ama oro kusebenzu kufane la nginshiso okunge nani kube okwezi nsuke zine ngeveki. Imi sebenzu efanele kayo enga kikrizi ikapen kufanele ikrini seki isefuti isekele yiningi. Nezi ndela zoku kikriza ezi sekelewe enani nezi kile mvelu. Ukusechu nzisa kusekele ngonguwezi mali kanyi nezi ndela zoku pila ngomnotu wombano. Umnoto njalu usekelewe zindingwe ni nine, futi usebenzisa amandla umnoto mwkwenda ando ye ningi. Nda wone ne system ye sibonelelo, sibonelelo, se hole eli isi sekelewe lenda weyong i ayu big. E hambi sana ni mi kikrizo yompagati ekona kakati. Zongi mi sebenzi e zinga vikelwa. Uchincho olutinga kayo futi ino mpakati wongano uzo kwa zugu netezeka. Iayu big izo kutaza ngoku vamile. Iayu big izo kutaza ngoku vamile kutuma kwe sinkompile labante ema pakati ino onga sa sebenzi. Ilke mobiliteit en skoen energie openbare vervoer selsels. Die motorbedrijf vertra een reëse verantwoordelijkheid voor die ondermijning van skoon energie openbare vervoerstelsels en verkwistende belegging in dier pad infrastructuur. Hier die skade kan beëindig word met groter steun vir stap, fietsrij, skoon energie motorfietse, perde en donkies as maniere van ekomobiliteitsvervoer. Stede en dorpe moet ook motorvry wees en infrastructuur en ekomobiliteit verskaf. Elke gemeenskap moet geïntegreer wees by een massevervoerstelsel van busse, treine en trams wat met herniebare energie gedruif word en by hybride technologieën wat de plaaslijke ekovervaardiging ondersteun word. Die vervoer van goedere moet ook na spoor verskuif. Nie elektrische fossiel brandstof gedreve motors moet ook uitfaseer word. Lig en seevervoer moet ook ontkool of beperk word. Zero afval en een eenvoudige leven. Masse verbruik van basisse grondstoffe en een superstar leefstijl is halbron intensief, verkoestend en koolstof gecentreerd. Verder is opvullingsterreine, die verbranding van afval en besoedeling van ecosysteme skadelik. Zero afval voltooi die cirkel met herwinning, hergebruik, ekonomische beginsels wat berus op solidariteit en volhoubare ontwerp in ons ekonomie, so dat daar minder of geen ontginning van grondstoffe is nie. Sekere technologieën, soos enkel gebruik plastic, moet verband word. Met die eenvoudige leefwees kan ons met die minimale hulpbron en koolstof voetspoor leef. Eco-social housing, buildings and transition towns. Many existing homes are not designed to deal with climate extremes. Moreover, many are still homeless in our society, while the rich have golf courses. We need to retrofit existing buildings and homes to handle more heat and weather extremes. Similarly, new homes must be designed as part of eco-communities, villages, towns, municipal rental schemes and cities, where construction methods use natural materials have minimal impact on the environment and provide for eco-social land needs of individuals as part of a community. Such needs are for housing, agroecological food production, sustainable water use, biodiversity, child rearing and culture. Cement is not used in, in this context given its huge carbon footprint and has to be phased out as a building technology. 
Beyond mainstream economics, the assumptions that economics makes about human behavior, nature, profits, markets, commodities, and growth is destroying everything. Mainstream economics merely justifies the wealth for a few. Their destructive use of resources and resulting pollution and carbon emissions. Our economies have to serve our needs as socio-ecological beings and the needs of ecosystems. We need an economics that takes into account ecological footprints, happiness, well-being, the resilience of ecosystems through regular audits, the commons and planetary boundaries. Our economics must be orientated around concepts and tools that assess the state of all living creatures and ends the harm to humans as well as non-human nature. This should serve as the basis of agenda setting, policy, resource allocation and democratic planning. Izikebe kulundu luetu zisebenzi sa imi tombu nguutu etisileyo za pembela nga kumbi izi ndu ezi pila enenda au ezi pila guzo. Kwa ye zikupa ikaponi eninzi. Basikwele tasonge ikiala wizi ndu ezi pila yu kunye enenda au ezi pila guyo. Kwa ye kufuneke ba utuwalilu mtuwalo wezi mali wenguku enzulu enubulu ngisa. Oko kuteta ukuba. Ba, oko kuteta ukuba masisla ule khafu ye kiala le mozulu izi kebi. I khafu ezi pezulu eku ambene nge ngwelo moya i cheti za butala izi tuti zo titi ne moto zombani. I khafu ye kaponi e kubayo e chulisuweyo kumakumkho enza ukunguliseko anga yekiyo ukusebenzisa kukukauleza ngokoneleyo i kaponi. Kunye ne khafu yobulungisa kwi mozulu kubukumkho kunye nukulu mende ulua pulu mteto kwe kaponi. Aba sebenzi kufuneke ba sebenzi se ikiala. Aba sebenzi kufuneke ba sebenzi se ikiala kumtala panzi kunye na kuinga wa mali yabo yobekelo. Oko bekwenza ngolaulu lemi sebenzi ukutuniseka ukuba inguko enzulu inobulu ngisa ia shangabeza na ne mfuno zabo kwa ye ikasa utalwa kwe banki ye sizwe ye nsebenzi suwano ukungaita ii ndao so kusebenzi sa uluntu ne mizi ngenguko ya manda umbani wa segushalini ovu seleloayo kwenye noku penyezwa kwe kwe nga kwezo zenguko enzulu enobulungisa inkaso kakulumende kufuneke na kanjalo ii ambe ne khafu Yokunga, yokunga zalisi oku, oku ngone sileyo. Izikwayo, zo, uzikwayo zo nge liselo ukuye kwa kwe nkaso ye kiesi ezi ne kaponi kunye ni minye imiteto e kubayo yoku khafisa. Knowledge is crucial for survival. There is a big knowledge gap in society regarding the worsening climate crisis. We have to draw on different knowledge systems to raise public awareness and survive. Indigenous knowledge has powerful resources to assist us and has to be retrieved, learned and respected. Earth system science, including climate science, is essential to inform the public about the climate crisis and its challenges. Climate science as people science has to be complemented by lived experience based on observing and learning from ecosystems. Given the complexity of climate change, research and innovation to ensure systemic transformation and to advance the public interest must be supported. Universities and schools must take these knowledge challenges on board. Emergency, holistic and preventative healthcare. Inequality in healthcare means climate harms will bring injustice such as during the COVID-19 pandemic. We need workable, accessible and respons responsive public healthcare systems to meet people's needs and address the health challenges that come with climate heating. Such healthcare systems must be capable of dealing with emergencies, psychological trauma, diseases, and new epidemics. Holistic care and preventative orientation at the grassroots have to be strengthened. Rights of nature and natural climate solutions. Our oceans have been polluted, forests destroyed, land stolen, and biodiversity loss increased, all due to the pursuit of profit. 
If we are to survive, all living creatures need to be respected. All life and all ecosystems on our planet are deeply intertwined and need to exist, persist, and regenerate their vital cycles. The rights of nature approach recognizes the intrinsic value of all non-human life forms. Moreover, nature has its own solutions to climate change from which we can learn. Such solutions include conservation, restoration, and land management activities that increase carbon storage across forests, wetlands, grasslands, coastal ecosystems, and agroecological farmlands. Community-led biodiversity registers are crucial to protect and advance natural climate solutions. Kufanele ba beke isi ayenzi yoku chincha kwe simo sezulu njengente ebu trae futi bazisi umparati mailana nenlekelele ya simo sezulu. Izi nkinga ze ngu bongo omo kanyi na, na masisti umatlukila adinga galayo. Izi ndawe zi patenele ne simo sezulu kufanele si, si, kufanele si za kwaze emesa kwazeni umabona kudine zi ndawe zi nyateli swayo. Op pad na mensgedrewe klimaatgerechtigheidsstaat. Die Zuid-Afrikaanse staat moet een klimaatgerechtigheidsstaat worden wat die klimaatnood in die licht van een versterkende democratie erken. Dit moet geleid worden door die visie, doelwitte, beginsels en mensgedrewe systemische alternatieve wat in hier die handvest vervat wordt. En als die klimaatsbeleiden moet een lijn gesteld worden om hier die handvest te ver verwezenlijk. Meer specifiek zal het klimaatrecht verder gestaat ook. Deelnemende beplanning voor diepgaande oorgangen van onderafmondelijk maak. Openbare financieringmechanismes zoals openbare klimaatverzekeringsfonds en groen verplichtings ontwikkel. Een klimaatcrisismandaat aan die reservebank lever. Alle openbare en privaat financieringsinstellings Heroriënteer om die diepgaande rechtmatige oorgang te steun en belastingvoorstellen in hier die handvest te bevorderen. Progressieve regulaties verzekeren wat die verwoestende logica van kapitaal in kort, perken plaats op corporaties en, in bijzonder, een verbod plaats op enige toekomstige fossielbrandstof ontginning. Alle staatspraktijken, koolvrij maak en in al zijn activiteiten een zero koolstof voetspoor behaal. Staatsrechtsteer administratief en grondwettelijk heronverd omdat delen van die land onleefbaar geraak het. Kulungiselwe is iswe njengo ba amazinga oluanle ekula. Futi kutatwe is nyatelo ezifanele njenge ngenye yoku bamba ikaza eguseleni. Kutiniswe uhulumeni wendao uguze abe na mantla atutugisiwe. Kanye na mantla okuhlela kwentando yeningi okupekana okupekana nenkinga yesimo sezulu. Kwa kiwe ikono lezi kungo nge sistimu yoku laula kwentlegelele yesimo sezulu eholwa abantu. Esla nganisa isevisi yezo mlilo kazwe lonke. Izi peze lazo mpakati ezi sebenza ngoku kwele. Ama timba oku sabela ngoku shesha ezi mweni ezi putumayo. Umtamo onyugile we service yesi mosezulu, kaya nengu ala sizinda yoku laula kwentlegelele. Ukutazwe utuwa ningo no kusungula, uguze kukaliswe ushincholwe sistimu kusuge langezanti. Kukashiswe umpakati ngo kukubekayo, futi kukensegiswe ukuti, zonke zikungo zo umpakati zinga baholi, bogulungisa ubukondene nesi mosezulu. Kunishiswe ukonke ukusechenzi so kwe mali ogumoshayo. Kukatelwe inkosiso, futi kutopeshiswe izi sebenzi zika hulumeni. Kukuti kukashwe abantu abangono kakulu ezweni, uguze ba sebenzele uhulumeni. Kumelwe kwa kiwe uhulumeni onga kwasi, futi oholwa abantu besifazani. Kututukiswe uselo lobulungisa obu kondene ne simo sezulu, egu sebenzelane ni kwayo na manye amazwe. Ogu slanganisa, ugu vuselela irradical pan-Africanism. No ngogu kukuzela, ugu uma ugu kondene no bulungisa, ugu kondene ne simo sezulu, paka atiko hulumen base Afrika. Uguze kufu, kufunwe izi ngapeze loze sikwele itu se simo sezulu, emazweni, ase nyaka ato, ye climate justice deal. 
ukuvinjelwa kobulungisa obuqondene nesimo sezulu okubhekiswe emazweni ayizigebengu zokusetshenziswa kwe-carbon ukuba ubumbano ngokuqondene nababaleki nabafuduki ucwaningo amasistimu ahlukile ukuhlanganiswa kwamandla avuselelekayo amakhono okusabela enhlekeleleni eqondene nesimo sezulu kanye nesimemezelo sokuthi kuphele isivumelwano sezinto ezibaswayo ezimbiwayo kusistimu ye UN ezuzisa ohulumeni base Afrika People's Power for Commoning and a Climate Justice Deal for South Africa. A climate justice future can only be achieved through the power of united people. We have learned this through the struggle against colonialism, apartheid, and neoliberalism. Power lies in the different parts of society, in the systems we build, the organizations and movements that we are part of, and in the street politics we do. People's power has to be at the forefront of defending the living commons which sustains us and future generations. Human beings are an adaptable and flexible species. We understand the causes of the climate crisis and we have democratic, transformative and just solutions to prevent our extinction. This climate justice charter is a signpost, a trumpet call to move all of us in the direction of system change now and for a climate justice deal that ends the suffering of the most vulnerable and oppressed. Such a people-led initiative will ensure that we address the multiple crises confronting the country while affirming the hope of the many expressed in this charter. Let's Let's take a stand for a caring society and unite in South Africa and through international solidarity before it is too late. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for hanging on and watching that. It was immensely good. Um, I'm handing over to Jane now. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and the Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Forward to the Climate Justice Charter and Deep Just Transition to Sustain Life. Okay. Um... I'm taking over from Ferial uh, from this point. We're almost wrapping up. Um, we just have uh, one more thing to share with you, a tool for mass organizing. Uh, it basically comes, off, uh, comes from a web page that I've set up at my university for a new knowledge project called Emancipatory Future Studies. And it's going to house what is called the Arc of South African Life. And the Arc of South African Life is tied to, if you like, a countdown to 2030. This decade that we are in is the decade will that will determine whether we have a future or not as a species together with other non-human life forms. So it has a clock and it also has a repository space. So if you can take a photograph on your cell phone or a camera, whatever it is, you could upload that photograph. And basically it should be a photograph that makes a statement about what you think is imperiled or in danger, or is going to be lost as planetary heating continues. We are going to use the arc of South African life for climate justice advocacy. And we'll be sharing those photographs every year with the pol politically powerful in our society for them to understand what is at stake. So to inaugurate the arc of South African life today at this assembly, I want to call William Shoki. Uh, William, please share your screen and, and load your photograph. Thanks, Vish, uh, and, and thanks, everyone. It's, it's so exciting to be here. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen shortly. And what you'll be seeing before you is the website Vish just mentioned. 
and over here is the Ark of South African Life. And as you can see, it's got this interface where it looks kind of like uh, a little social media kind of interface, but obviously we're, we're letting the people in power know through this tool what we're losing. So I'm gonna not waste any time and upload the photo that I want to. Um, I'm gonna put in my full name here and put my city here. So I'm not gonna give a brief story about the picture because I'm going to, to describe that to everyone here. But the, the photo, and you will see it now, is actually a photo taken uh, this afternoon. Um, and I, I, was, I wasn't sure about what to, to put up because there's so much that's going to be jeopardized by, by climate catastrophe. But the reason I chose this photo, and it's, it's a bunch of us at Constitution Hill in front of the mural, and it was a picture taken by Sonny Morgan, who is someone who we see all the time in this space. But the reason I, I chose this photo is because I thought it was a, a contrast to um, what else was happening in the country today um, that some comrades mentioned earlier in, in Seneca. And I think that South Africa has two paths. It has the path of solidarity, as is portrayed in this photo, and it has the path of division and animosity and hostility. And I think that what is exemplified by this photo, which is friendship, uh, communal bonds, people coming together for something that they care about and not being divided by things that we cannot control, but saying that something we can control is our future and that should unite us and bring us together as I think is what ex is exemplified by this photo. So uh, now that I have to give a brief description, I'll say that um, this, photo uh, exemplifies collective power and what and that is imperiled as climate catastrophe makes us more divisive oops and inward so yeah I mean I just wanted to to share this photo I've, I've put it up over here. So I think this is now going to be viewable to everyone. There it is. Um, and I encourage everyone to do the same. And today was a special day and it was special that I was able to share it with the people in this photo and that this moment can be captured. And I, I can imagine that in the coming future, this is a photo that I look back upon and hopefully can, can reflect with pride in, in what this movement has been able to accomplish and what it will accomplish in the future. So it's been an honor and, and grateful to everyone and look forward to the struggle that we're all going to embark on together. And the important word there is together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, William. Um, Vandana, please share your photograph. And all just please be patient, we're almost there, we're almost done. Hi everyone, um, thank you for the opportunity uh, to let me share my, my photo. I'm just sharing my screen quickly. Ah, can you really see it? Not yet, see it? okay, it's coming. Hi, um, do you want yeah. see it? Yeah, we can see it. Excellent. Um, for me, um, you know, wildlife and our biodiversity has always been so important to me in, in my fight for climate justice um, as well. And one of my most amazing moments of my life was when I spent some time on my 25th birthday in a tiger sanctuary. Um, and as you can see, I really enjoyed my time with the little baby tigers. And in this moment, as we as we call to action for the next 10 years to to to, to stop our 1.5 degree Celsius uh, rise in temperatures. Um, I, I do it with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the cause in mind to save our planet, live within our planetary boundaries and, and support all of Earth's life. Um, and for me, the most important, um, important part to, to saving our planet is also for, for our non-human life as well. Um, and, and in this capsule over here is my submission of the baby tigers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vandana. Have you submitted it? Okay. Uh, Tiamo, you the last one, and then we're going to have the vote of thanks and wrap up. Tiamo. And Jane, can we share the link to the Ark of South African Life also in the chat group so everybody can start sharing it, etc.? cetera? Tiamo. Uh, okay, do you, do you see my screen? Yeah, it's coming up. Uh, okay, 
just like William, I have a gathering of us in solidarity. We have this thing called the Climate America uh, that we had last year at the University of the Free State. It's basically about connecting climate science to students. We set up stalls around campus, we played games and give our juice packs. But what I like about this image was we had a lot of fun as all the volunteers. It was just an amazing experience. You can see me there, third from the left, just celebrating. And this is something we lose out when the climate catastrophe hits. So uh, I have submitted. Okay, thank you, Tiamo. And Jane has shared the link. Uh, please use the arc of South African life to get the conversation going on the worsening climate crisis, what is in jeopardy, uh, the challenges, what we're gonna lose. I'm gonna call on Jane Cherry to lead on the vote of thanks. And then I'll just make a concluding comment or two and we'll end. Thank you for your patience. Jane. Thank you, Vish. So I'm just going to be brief. And first of all, thank you to everyone who's been part of the climate justice charter process from the very beginning. Um, so this includes all the constituencies such as faith, labor, media, scientists, youth, children, social justice and environmental justice organizations and activists and organizations in the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign. And just to say your inputs have formed the charter and carried the momentum for the climate justice charter in South Africa for the past six years. So thank you for all your contributions. Second, thank you to all of those who organized and rallied for local actions today by hosting pickets, painting, painting murals, hosting workshops. Um, it's activists such as yourselves who are building this movement from the bottom. And so a big thank you to, for you for raising awareness in your communities and on social media. Third, thanks to all those who spoke, chaired, presented and read um, on the program today. Thanks to the youth who read out the questions um, and those who showed us how to upload images. Thank you to the constituencies for your inputs. Um, Professor Francois Engelbrecht for always being willing, willing to share the climate science with us. And a special thanks to the youth in Cape Town who read out the charter um, last week for the recording and to George Kokinus for putting that recording together. Thanks to the media for always being a responsive ally um, in this process. And we look forward to you further mainstreaming climate justice politics in South Africa. And then thank you to all the political parties and Deputy Speaker of Parliament for joining us, for taking the time to be with us today. And thanks to all the participants um, who joined us and who've stayed with us right till the end, but who've also been journeying with us and joining our online events um, and our physical events that we hosted last year. And then to the COPAC team, I wonder if it's Lazy, Courtney Morgan, Ferial Adam, our associate, and Vishwa Satka for all your hard work. Um, there's been a lot of organizing that's been going into this over the past years, but especially in preparation for today's actions and online event. And then finally, thank you to our funders, Friedrich Ebert Stifting, for resourcing the production of the charter and the process. And also thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for supporting the National Day of Action and resourcing. Thank you, Vish. Vish, sorry, you muted. Sorry, and, and a big thank you to Jane Cherry for being the lead in the COPAC team. And um, just to conclude, um, the record of this uh, assembly, this historic assembly will be shared with parliament, all the parties, the speaker, the deputy speaker, and uh, together with all the supporting documentation. Secondly, I think it's very, very important that the conversation doesn't end here. We need to inform, uh, we need to empower the conversation in our society. We have provided a climate science document and a set of popular education tools around that. We've translated the Climate Justice Charter into all national languages. We also have an introductory guide to it in some of the national languages. We have the memorandum. Uh, please take this down into conversations, into your local spaces, into your organizations, etc. The struggle is not over. Uh, we are coming back here next year. We are giving Parliament a deadline. One year on World Food Day 2021, we are back here. We're going to be beating this drum throughout next year during local government elections, Earth Day, May Day, etc., etc. So please continue getting organizational endorsements. We must come back to parliament with thousands of organizations standing with us. We must also get the petition signed. We are at about 4,000 signatures. 
by next year when we come to parliament, we must hopefully have a few million on the petition at Amandla Mobi. Please use the arc of South African life. It's a tool of climate justice. It's to, it's to, it's to get everyone in our lives, our loved ones, our friends, our families, our community, to start thinking deeply about our connections. So please propagate the arc of South African life as a climate justice tool. The final thing I'll say to you all is that today, together, we have taken a historic step. We have launched not just the charter process into parliament, but we have also taken a big step in terms of building a climate justice charter movement in South Africa. This is part of the third cycle of global resistance. And we've got to come out of this movement institutionalized with capacity, with strength. There's a lot to do after this. We're going to be working on a climate justice deal for South Africa. We are going to be doing policy work on how we translate the charter in everyday institutions, in communities, etc., into policies. We're going to continue our campaigning against fossil fuel corporations, and we're going to be doing just transition work from below. So together, comrades, we have a lot to do to transform South Africa. Thank you for being part of this process, giving your time, your ideas, your passion, and your commitment. Amandla, and take care. Away to thank you, Vish.